All right. So, Hit Ski, Ski, go ahead. At least remember, <laughs> I would forget every time. Ski, go ahead and do your introduction. <laughs> oh, well, here we are. Today, Sunday, August the 16th, uh, 2009. Uh, I'm Ski Sonic. I'm here with Bunke and uh, Shen Blanca. This is Alpha It's Radio. And tonight, I'm bringing to you Marvel vs. Capcom 2. In depth, part two. Uh, originally, my guest tonight was going to be Viscount, and we were going to reprise our conversation last week where we went through the history of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 from really the beginning up until 2003, the, uh, the, the birth of the Justin Long era uh, through the beginning where the, the, the old kings ruled the game. Um, started out strategy and uh, kind of touched on, on some deeper topics there. That show is going to be put on a bit of a hold. I'm going to be bringing to you an abbreviated version tonight. Um, Fiscant is uh, unfortunately unavailable tonight. He had to hop onto a plane, so we're not going to get him. I'm going to bring to you uh, one of my... I'm basically going to give you guys an MVC2 primer. Um, I think this will be really good for anyone that's um, maybe trying to get into the game, trying to learn things about the game, and has been exposed to the scene, but doesn't necessarily know where to get started, so that should be fun. Um, but the first thing I think I wanted to do, um, I, I don't really know if every, anyone's been necessarily listening already. Have you already talked, did you already talk about your tutorial? Uh, do, do you want to talk about that now? Well, he didn't, I mean, he didn't record it, so he might as well talk about yeah, it again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, okay. Do well, that. I'm just, just going to sure. make this short and sweet. Um, oh, wait. I forgot to tell you guys. I got one other thing that I'm going to be bringing to you guys. It's pure ill science. Straight science. Y'all ain't ready for this kind of science. I've been boasting about this kind of science for like, for like, I don't even know how long. It's been weeks, months. My science is immaculate, and you're going to get to feel some of the science and see what it's like being ski sonic. So scientific. All right. Yeah, you're not ready for that, but you're going to check it out later. Anyway, back to your tutorial. I'm going to make this short and sweet. Um, after much thinking uh, and much feedback, I decided to revive the tutorial for Marvel. Um, basically, um, I'm doing this for Sue Mighty. Sue really doesn't need an introduction as far as the people that have been in the Marvel scene. Um, he's considered one of the best in the country. This is a guy that doesn't play Marvel half the year, but still plays his top ten every year at Evolution, which boggles the fucking mind. But um, basically, we was talking um, last week, and... Um, we were talking about um, what I did with Street Fighter 4 with Justin, and he was interested in doing something similar. So we are setting up um, the tutorial service again. Um, this is half the price of the original. It is not 20 bucks; it's 10 bucks now, and it's for 10 games. Um, basically, what Sue would do, he will play with you. He is not going to destroy you. It's, I mean, he's, it's more defensive. He's going to play defensive to see what your gameplay is like, and then give you live feedback while you're playing the game. He is not just going to, to, you know, play, you know, don't look at the Justin video from 2003 and think that's going to happen to you. That's not the whole point. The whole point isn't to, you know, to kill you in 10 seconds, which you can do, but it's to find out uh, what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and what to do next, what team you're using, all of, you know, all of that. That's what he's really going to be focusing on. So, it's going to be pretty fun. Um, I think that, um, I'm hoping that um, I will have some of the success of what I did with Justin, and, and hopefully it ends a lot better than it did with Justin. So, I mean, you can ask anybody. And, in fact, if you go on SRK and the Marvel 2 thread, you will see um, a sticky that, um, that um, Pride so graciously gave my thread. And, I mean, there are people in there that are vouching for him already. I'm like, this dude is the, is the business. I mean, if you don't know Sue Mighty, um, he... Basically, the, the, the Magneto rushed down. He wasn't the first with it, as, as far as I remember. But, man, his Magneto simply became one of the most aggressive, dominant Magnetos, really up until Yipe showed up, um, that you'll probably ever see. You know. Oh, yeah, I'm going to touch on what Sue Mighty brings to Magneto a later, little, little later on. But um, it's really something really very unique. His Magneto style is, is some, something that many try to emulate, but really few can master. Yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I mean, he has a gift, you know, as, as most of the top Marvel players do. I mean, 
Um, and also, you know, but don't, but don't think that just because that he plays MSP a lot and everything that he does not know anything about Santhrax or Matrix. Actually, in the California regional tournaments, back when he was really active, he was winning tournaments with Santhrax. I mean, so it's not like, so don't, don't think that just because his main character is Magneto that he doesn't know any of the other characters in the game. That's just not true. No, he won don't. a lot of tournaments where he would just mirror match people throughout the whole tournament. Yeah, now, but what we were discussing before is, do you really want to go down that road again? Also, um, I have another part question. Besides that, is can you really teach someone to correctly play Marvel Two on a next gen, you know, system? I think with that it basically being the PlayStation Two port of it. PlayStation Two. It kind of seemed like that. No. I mean, I'm not no Marvel aficionado, but I mean, there, there it's are, not on point. There are bugs in the game, um, but most of the bugs surround the online aspect of it and the and, and the uh, and the interface. Um, for example, on the PS3, if you just click on Find a Match, or um, it'll freeze. The, the PlayStation 3 will freeze. You have to hard boot the console again. But the gameplay is about 90, I would say about 98% intact. I mean, uh, most of the issues have to do with the online aspect, which was to be expected. But I'm a, I am more than a little disappointed because some of these bugs bear resemblance to the HDR um, fiasco. And it seems like that. I don't know what's going on over there at Backbone. But, I mean, really, twice in a row is kind of unacceptable at this point. Um, I really can't believe that some of these bugs have not been caught e um you know, earlier, you know, and we keep on hearing that we played it and we didn't have any problems. I'm like, but yeah, but you said that about HDR and it's still, I mean, I'm talking about stuff that's, that doesn't even really relate to the gameplay. I'm talking about, for example, you know, people winning matches and then it gets booked as a loss. Um, Preppy goes into, wow. goes in, into that in depth where he has played people and won and it counts as a loss. Wow. So, I mean, I mean, and then, of course, with the PS3, searching for a match freezes the console. How can someone not find that? I mean, dude, no. dude, man, the game has like hella bugs. It's so obviously in a state where I mean, it's it's in a state like a a late beta stage where it's clearly not done. It's kind of like HD Remix was at the beginning. Uh, I don't know. I think we gotta just get used to this uh, strat marketing strategy where. They can only they they pay for part of the game essentially up front, and then the game is sold, and the first run of sales of the game finances the programmers uh, fixing it up, and that's the way that we show that we want it. I mean, whatever. If that's the way that it's got to be, then that's the way it's got to be. Hopefully, we can provide them with good feedback. So everybody should check out that thread in the Marvel vs. Capcom 2 section and post what kind of bugs you find. I don't know. It's there are a lot of damn bugs, but for you know what's all said and done, this is a ten-year-old game that was ported to a new system, and they were trying to keep it intact, which is kind of. Uh, it's a really tall order, and it's it's something that we as a community, we kind of have grown to expect it. But from the standpoint of the programmers, the people that are doing that, it's it's not uh, an everyday task that you would be doing. That you know that, that that as a game maker, you have to preserve every. Uh, Incons or inconsistency and idiosyncrasy of a ten-year-old piece of software on, you know, totally new hardware and and down to every little nuance. So I mean, it kind of goes to show you how I don't know how hardcore people can get, I guess. But but you know, but but the thing about it is that as far as the Xbox, I mean, for the Xbox Live and for the PS3, the gameplay itself is there. I mean, there's really, there's really That's only. That's debatable, man. No, it, it, it mean, is there. There is only, the only the only issue that has nothing to do with the online aspect of it, which I expected. The only thing that's been a problem is that Magneto's light, um, his his uh, ROM infinite doesn't work correctly because there's the timing is off on his light, his light kick and his, into his medium kick. That is the really the not, only oh, one. That's not. There is that's slow online. down. Huh? Mm. There's slow down when. You 
when you I, have Storm Magneto offline, they're slowed down in the game. I, I, I mean, well, there's there's been talking about slowed down in Xbox 360 port. On the PS3, I played through the arcade mode about I don't know five times now, and I'll just you know, play against game. someone. No. You'll see it. Um, also, oh, I mean offline? that's my concern as a tournament organizer. I can't have that in my tournament because that's a POS. That's not tournament worthy. I mean, it's well, not. Like, like I said, I've, I said last time, I've heard that the they are committed to patching this game to at least making it tournament playable. I don't know I if they're going to. So. But that was um, some things that I heard initially uh, related to the game. So there's, there's a good chance of that kind of thing happening. But I don't know. The game plays. The the main things that really affect the gameplay are, like you said, the, the, there are some slight timing differences on certain moves, like the Magneto Infinite and certain things like that. But you know, I we're gonna have to play with it the way it is for at least as long as for the time being. So you know, I think as a tournament organizer or whatever, or as a tournament player, we just have to come down to deciding: do we want to just play on Dreamcast, or do we want to try to play it on a new system? And I mean. Uh, there's tournaments right now that are being... I, I think Seasons Beatings is, is planned to be thrown on Dreamcast. I really think it's a convenience factor or whatever for the tournament. I don't think that this version is so bad that it is unplayable in tournament. And I think that, you know, maybe the Marvel crowd will have to put up with uh, a little bit of what the, the ST crowd had to put up with where they played a few different versions for a few years. I mean... We're in, you know, uncharted territory as far as this type of thing is concerned. It's been slightly charted by ST, so now this is the second coming. So if we're going to have to deal with a little bit of that, then we may just have to put up with it. At least we have a good uh, alternative available for the tournaments that have access to Dreamcast, you know? Okay, I mean, that's fair enough. I just have a lot of people telling me that, you know, and me noticing I'm not a Marvel head, you know what I'm saying? But I notice things. And to me, I don't see it as being viable, you know, or being mm-hmm. serious. Now, maybe it could be a side tournament or something like that. But, I mean, not to get into the whole argument of arcade perfect, this, that, and the other, because I think those days are gone. Right. What I'm thinking is the game should play correctly if it's arcade perfect or console perfect or whatever you want to say. The game should play correctly. That's all I care about. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think there's, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that the the jury is still slightly out on that, but I definitely noticed some things that, that yeah, there's some problems. But I, I haven't, I, I haven't really played a lot of it offline. I've played probably like a hundred games maybe offline, and I noticed mainly the things that throw me are things that I say, I, I look at and say, oh, that wasn't really supposed to happen like that. But there's rarely something that just makes me go, whoa, like that was totally effed up and uh, I'm not cool with that, you know. But sometimes I just kind of see like, it just seems like hitboxes kind of resolve a little bit differently. Like a lot of times I feel like I end up on the side that I shouldn't be on or certain things like that. I have a, I have a hypothesis on that. Um, something that Preppy told me, you know, he says that this game is not based on the U.S. Dreamcast or even the Japanese retail Dreamcast version. This is based on the online Dreamcast version, which is an entirely different animal. That's why you cannot switch characters um, after you you um, after you select them at the character select screen. And he huh. and, and some of the things he's saying that some of them um, there might be a little some some differences because there are some differences even between the U.S. and the Japanese version. Um, so there he's saying that there's a possibility that it may not be so much as a as like they did something wrong with the moves or the, or it might be that that this is the you know the online Dreamcast version and there's slight I give you a good example and Viscant was talking about how he hated when they went from. Um, arcade to, um, to Dreamcast for Evolution because the Nyquist was nerfed in the American Dreamcast version. But in the online version on, on the PS3 and Xbox 360, he is not nerfed. So that so it is obviously there are differences between these versions. And 
I mean, so that might be a, just an example of it. Some hitboxes are different. Some combos work that shouldn't. You know, well, I own the um, Japanese version of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and have a Japanese Dreamcast. So, this PlayStation 3 stuff don't play like that. It just doesn't. No, but what I'm saying is, but he's, but what Preppy was saying is that it's that the Dreamcast version in in the Japanese stores, the retail version that you play in the Dreamcast. Yeah, that's why I got I got the import. You right, know? right. I don't that's, have no burn not, anything. I got the import joint. But that's not what the game was based on. It was based on the online Dreamcast version, which is a separate. Yeah, that build. game had net play. That game originally had net play, so yeah. he's talking. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so I yeah, know. I mean, when I put my play, when I put my uh, Dreamcast in. I can get, you know, I see the little internet net play thing for the Japanese. I just can't read Japanese, um, you know, language or anything like that. But, yeah, I know it had net play. Yeah, but you can't play that because you're not in Japan. So yeah, he's exactly. saying the code for that game might have was, was already somewhat altered for the online version in its original incarnation. Right. And they tried to preserve right. that. And so there's probably bugs being introduced that they didn't know about because people didn't play that one originally. Right. Personally, I don't buy that just because I blame Mike Z. <laughs> um, I know you played this. Mike Z and other guy, I blame you guys. What the hell were you? This was on your watch. <laughs> Maybe I should contact them and ask them to come on the show and explain now. But no. Yeah, no, do it. Yeah, real Stays talk. In Someone need to... Sonic interviews Mike Z. Asks him, why is Cable's Air Hyper Viper Beam unblockable? Why? Because they put the Super Freeze back in there. For some reason, see, that's why I thought it was the PlayStation 2 version. Because it had those Super Freezes that was in X-Men vs. Street Fighter. If you hold them forward and they activate the Super, you're fucked. You know what I'm saying? I, I That's an old because, school Super Freeze thing. I think it's because of input lag, because in Cable's HVB, it covers the entire screen in one frame. Yeah. So if you're uh, not blocking... Yeah, the move is different. Like, the way that the move looks is different, because it spreads faster than it did. Um, and, but, but, but on the Dreamcast version, I mean, the U.S. Dreamcast version, it, it, I mean, I remember looking at the frame data for it, and it says, you know, for one frame for... The HVB between, you know, it coming out and hitting you, where no matter where you are on the screen, is one frame. So if there is a two or three frame or two free frame input delay, I mean, I would easily explain why the instant that you do not, if you if you're not blocking when the super freeze hits, then you're fucked. You know. Yeah, yeah it's I thought it would be the other way. The animation of the move looks different now. It just looks like it spreads faster than it did before you could see it extend and that was the frame where you could move you had more than one frame before after the super freeze because mm -hmm. you could teleport after cable did and it had a viper beam with, with spiral so you had at least three frames to enter a uh, spiral teleport you know what i'm saying you had frames to unfly with sentinel you know but if you were too close then you can't get hit by it the way that it acts now is as if you were too close everywhere on the screen all the time. Actually, it's even worse than that now because it just hits you when you were blocking. But like it, it just it acts like it's bigger. It's it's extended faster than it was before. That's my take on it. My question is: Are you guys sure that it's a dream? Is it any kind of Dreamcast version? And to me, it seemed like it's a PlayStation Two version. I mean, they said it was. I don't see why they would lie and say that it wasn't. Okay, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, man. I mean, they, they just definitely said that. So, like, if they were going to base it on any of them and, you know, fans would just come clean because they're telling us all these other things that they were doing. So, I mean, I, we, we believe so. We have no reason to believe not. But, you know, it is what it is. Okay. Hello. They, I mean, I have no reason to doubt when they say they use the Dreamcast build of it. I mean. Yeah, but I also wouldn't doubt that they used the online Dreamcast build and didn't quite n mention that caveat. Yeah, yeah, now that I would agree with. Uh huh. Man, uh, I don't know what else to say other than I mean, well, I mean, unfortunately, um, Ray Jimenez said, well, he said that they're fixing it, you know, right, you know, but he also said it'd be a one to two month process. So, well, you know. That's so, I look at this just like KOF 12 to me. That's exactly how I look at it. The exact same thing, you know. 
It's it's pretty decent. You know what I'm saying? I don't see any slowdown like that comparison to KL twelve to to Marvel, but I'm not really a Marvel head. So I'm not gonna go in to depth like you guys can say, Well, this works, this doesn't, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm just saying like to the eye, you know, what my eye see and what I'm playing. Just like I notice stuff like I play with Iron Man. That's probably the only character I can really play decently with. And I could do the infinite, you know, pretty good and I'm just like, Oh, I'm missing it and it's just like, Oh, this is stupid. And I'm not playing against anybody online. I'm just doing it, you know, offline, trying to get the timing right. It's like, come on, seriously. Yeah, sometimes so. it seems to me like the hit stun is just slightly different after a number of hits, and I, I don't really know. I can, I can propose, uh, you know, a logical reason for that, but that's just what it looks like because it, it looks like the same type of thing that comes into play when you're doing the ROM Infinite now. As it's called, and it it gets there's a hit around 15 hits or so, where it's just hard. It, they drop essentially, and you if you if maybe if you like um, tighten up your timing on that one and make it a little bit faster than you were supposed to, yeah. then they necessarily drop. But yeah, it's that kind of thing. It, it, but it looks like to me that the body of the person that you're hitting moves in a weird way in that position. That's why I'm kind of relating it to the hit stun. But I'm okay, gonna, I see, I see, I see. No, that explains it. That explains it better. But from my perspective, I can't. I mean, I couldn't, in good conscience, say, "Okay, that's going to be the version without a patch." You know. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, it's just like something to kick around with and be able to play online with and accept it for what it is. But I don't necessarily think that you should throw this game at tournaments until it's fixed, unless you just don't have Dreamcast available and, you know, people are going to accept for what, for what it was. That's true. Okay, another question. Was this supposed to be a remake or was it supposed to be a perfect port? Supposed to be a perfect if it's supposed to be a remake, I don't really think you're supposed to compare HD Remix with this if it's supposed to be a perfect port. Um... I mean, it's supposed to be a port. I don't think it's supposed to be necessarily perfect, but it's just supposed to be like a ported version. Like it's 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 somewhere in between a port and a remake because it's the same game and it's not changed. But it's not like like the menus and shit are different. You know, it's not the same game. But well, it's I the understand same. that. But I'm just saying, like, was it labeled? Was it it's not labeled, basically man. labeled? And basically marketed towards us to saying, "Hey, this is Marvel vs. Capcom 2 Remix," you know, in some way or form. Because I don't think it's fair to compare HD Remix. That was supposed to be a brand new game. At first, it wasn't, but then they said, "Okay, we're gonna redo, we're gonna tweak a little things, this, that, and the other." That's why it came out a year later. Now, uh, the the remix part of it no, it's just HD. So the remix, like you know, HD has the remixed mode, and Marvel just has HD graphics. But it's still supposed to be a part of the same game, which is pretty graphics. Okay. Well, um, they need a patch. Yeah, if that's the case, yeah, I just don't like the comparisons of HD remix. Compared to that, when HD Remix was supposed to be a different game, so of course some people are gonna rebel against it who like original Super Turbo, and then others gonna say, "Hey, it's a breath of fresh air. You know, let's try this out." Yeah, well, I mean, the bugs that were originally in the game were bugs that were regard that, that existed. Um, you know, independent of the remix mode or the regular mode, because, you know, you can play the classic mode as well, but the game had just glitches that... Yeah, it does. It did. It know, did. The, the life bar glitches and all these things, you know, that... Yeah. So that's um, the kind of thing I think, you know... The reason why I was keep on mentioning why I was complaining the HDR version to Marvel is because some of the same interface problems are present. Not so much as the gameplay, but the interface problems that should have... There's no way that that they should be in the game. You should not freeze a console by just looking for a match. 
Yeah, I feel you on that. Yeah, that's real janky right there. Yeah, it sucks. You know, and I mean, I think that the game can be salvaged. I mean, I think that um, they may have to go back and compare the online Dreamcast version to the uh, U.S. Dreamcast version and see if it's a bug that they introduced or a bug that was already present in that make. Because after all, I mean, nobody in, in Japan, I don't think they played a hard body like that. So. You know, they, no, they didn't. So they wouldn't know about some of these, you know, some of these irregularities that, um, just like the irregularities between the U.S. Uh, the Dreamcast version and the arcade version. I mean, I mean, so that's that's, that's a, a a good hypothesis right there, Ski. That um, they probably didn't know. They probably just thought that it would just be the exact same as um as the other, you know, Dreamcast ports, and they found out that they wasn't. So we'll just see. Um, but going back to the, um, I'm just going to finish up right quick. If you are interested in um, in this um, in having a, um, a tutorial with Sue, then you know just hit up the Alphaism forum and I'll never roll within, and it's pretty basic, you know. And um, I think that if you're serious about learning Marvel, then um, and you and you pass the whole point of knowing what you know, knowing the basics, but you just want to know. What makes good you know, team chemistry? What should you be thinking about when you're playing? And you know how do you uh, uh, you know how do you fight fight the, the the top four and all of that? I mean, this will be great for that. So um, I hope that uh, I encounter some of the success that I have with Street Fighter Four, but we'll see. So basically, they need to know what Sandthrax is in MSP or or. Just learn that first, and then come the tutorials, right? <laughs> I mean, as long as they know the basics, I mean, I mean, if they're not, okay. I mean, we can't be going up here and say how to do a fireball. Um, I mean, but if they, but but there's a lot of people out there that are in between that stage of newbie, but you know, they still don't know what to go from there. They just need some direction, and that's what Sue's going to help them with. Anybody had their points erased yet? When they're playing online, I heard about uh, it. Marvel. Yeah. Mm, no. Okay, well, I raised my hand. Yes. <laughs> so that yeah, happened got, to me. So that's I'm, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, it's buggy. Yeah, it's buggy. The porch bugs. There are gonna be bugs. <laughs> there will be bugs. Oh, I got whooped up on. And then I whooped on some people. It was surprising. Just like, you know, there's a lot of race quitters in Marvel too. <laughs> oh, Yo, Take oh my god. Lot. Yeah, you know, I played my first day because I I figured I would play until my first race quit, and and it got me. It took me 20 minutes. You know, a little bit longer than I expected. But <laughs> I don't know. It's really fun. That's that's why I'm here tonight. That's what I want to talk about tonight. The the people that want to be able to play and be competitive and um, are trying to trying to figure out where they want to jump into the game, or maybe you have like a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of exposure to the scene. You know, I want to address those people. Yeah, and if people lose to Doom. Iron Man and uh, Big Blunt, go just go stop playing. Uninstall the game. Don't play Marvel, especially if you send hate mail. <laughs> stop playing that team. I mean seriously. <laughs> well, anyway, so I've been I've played a bunch of players online, um, and I've played uh, players of like varying skill level, and it seems like most of the people have some interest in running the game. But I, I notice some like holes in the game, some some things that can be quickly addressed, um, and also there's definitely probably a, a class of players that are, are definitely interested in this game and are hoping that maybe there is a resurgence of the game and maybe they can get in now. So um, anyway, the game Marvel vs. Capcom 2 is. As we all know, six buttons, four attack buttons, the lights and the fierces, the, the lights turn into the strongs in combos. And the last two buttons are assist buttons. When your second and third character have assist attacks, 
well, all your characters have assist attacks. These assist buttons are assigned to your assist, assist attacks, and they can be used in conjunction with combos or really almost at any time during the fight infinitely to um, assist you in your fight. They come out and do a, a, a predetermined uh, attack. Um, this game is like other Street Fighter games, like but very different in many ways. Like we just said, uh, six buttons, but only four of them actually attack. You don't have access to your strong attacks. Um, the game is paced very differently from a Street Fighter game. Um, some of your same fundamental um, uh, um, principles of Street Fighter are there, but they exist in a kind of... Uh, hyperbolic, really, really extreme uh, uh, forms like like footsies um, are, are kind of handled from almost uh, a full screen range and the, the really tall screen um, kind of brings an extra dimension to the game that sometimes turns people off but can make for, you know, a really exciting game. Um, you know, you will see some matches where the a character a, a character is not visible on screen. One of the two main characters fighting is not visible on screen for a long time because the other character is forcing the camera up and off and making it tough. But these are just things that are part of the game. Um, if you're used to Street Fighter, certain things don't really exist in this game that do in other games, like counter hits. Um, there is no extra advantage for any type of counter hit that you land. Um, meaty attacks don't exist in this game in the same format. You don't you don't get any extra frame advantage for any meaty place attack like you would in any other game. Um, reversal attacks do not exist in this game uh, either. That's why, for instance, Sentinel's unblockable in the corner is totally inescapable if done correctly after the air combo because you really can't reversal. He can only you can only reversal I think if he messes that up. Okay, moving on. That's the really, really basics of the game. Um, and I should basically move straight into the top four. Uh, Storm, Sentinel, Cable, and Magneto. Um, the reason that these characters are... should be explained, I think, with the, with the next level past the basics of the game is that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 has become a game at high levels that is developed around... Um, or is, is highly... Um, comprised of these high-level techniques um, that are used kind of um, at will and, and, and liberally uh, that make it tougher to use um, other characters against that kind of thing without using that at all. So things like wave dashing, um, triangle dashing, fast fights, these are things that you need to know. Wave dashing, which is um, dashing quickly, uh, canceling your dash with a crouch and then dashing again, it makes you, uh, you can, it allows you to cover a large portion of the screen very quickly and very safely. Um, triangle dashing, which is doing a, an air dash pointed downward at your opponent and doing a fast overhead. Fast flight, um, extended fast, uh, combos with Sentinel in the air that employ canceling the flight animation quickly to, um, enable you to do stronger and more damaging combos that can throw in an assist. Um, these are things that are character exclusive or better with, um, you know, these characters. Try dashing, you know, can only be done with characters with an air dash. Everyone in the game doesn't have an air dash. If you don't have a try dash character, then your offense is severely limited if you want to play an offensive style. Um, if you want to play a defensive style and you can't, guard break very well or you can't air hyper viper beam loop which um, are techniques that are cable has basically some of the best guard break game in the in the game and air hyper viper beam loop is obviously exclusive to him then um, you're not going to be able to convert on some of these uh, opportunities where on defense you actually will get less hits or less opportunities than necessarily someone on offense in certain fights so there's a lot to the game, but if you want to jump in, you should definitely keep um, at least one of these characters in mind. You are not necessarily limited to these characters in your team choice, but like I said, you need to be able to do these things. And you know, if you want to if you want to play an offensive game, you need to be able to wave dash, try dash. You need to be able to do some infinite loop combos and resets because. That's what the highest level of the game um, uses. And, um, you know, 
there's not much of a counter for that type of thing. It's not the type of thing that that um, needs like a counter. It's just an available technique. You know, you can counter it by blocking. You can counter it by not letting it happen to you. But if you don't take advantage of being able to reset someone into doing big damage, you know, you're just missing out on the opportunity. So. Using those four characters, um, investigate the higher level techniques that are necessarily ex- that are somewhat exclusive to them or better with them. And um, right, so now you've said I want to jump into Marvel. I know the buttons. I know the characters. I learned some techniques. I've I've probably learned some combos. Ah, oh, go to zackd.com. You're gonna want to learn some combos. Watch some videos. You know, get the flow of these things. You can go to Sharkyuken.com, get some bit, some combos or whatever. Holler at me. Combos, don't worry about it. They're not that hard in this game. You'll get those um, next. Right. But here's what's important. After you have picked like a character and you know some techniques and stuff, the face-off of the game at the beginning. Okay. Because one of the reasons why this game seems so goddamn intimidating is because you can die immediately as soon as the game starts. You can just die. And if you didn't know what is happening, then, you know, you just you just don't know, and you're dead already. So I'll simply explain the hierarchy of the face-off to you, because these are just the things that have um, developed rapidly, well, not rapidly, gradually, throughout the course of the game, but everyone that sort of has grown with the game knows and kind of has this inherent back knowledge for, so what seems... Um, you know, like mysterious knowledge to that, to that, to you or to a new player, you know, is, is kind of standard to everyone else. So the fix off, okay? Options here are basically walk forward or walk backwards all the way, okay? You have about enough time to walk all the way forward to the middle of the screen or back into the corner. And if you're facing, because you're, the guy you're facing off against is probably Magneto and he's going to get in your damn face, okay? So Magneto's in your face. Magneto at the face off always has the advantage. Straight, point blank, period. Magneto is the guy that can win at the face. Okay? Magneto has options. He can go low. Um, Magneto switch glitched in with the low short is essentially the fastest low attack in the game. There are some exceptions. You know, Mega Man and Strider have some janky tactics that can trade with it. Um, Iron Man, you know, uh, has a stand roundhouse that will evade it. Sentinel can dash back um, and sometimes um, take a hit from the super armor and avoid what's follow up. But basically, what you need to know is Magneto at the face off. Fear him. If you're not him, you probably want to block. Block low. Look for the overhead. He's either gonna block. He's gonna gonna hit you low. He's gonna go up and down on your head, or he's gonna cross you up, maybe with Psylocke backing him up. And you know, one of these three options basically are gonna be the things that he's he's gonna try to get that snap right there and kill you and eliminate you. So if you want to get into this game, look at that. Know that. Realize that Magneto is going to try to either hit you low, or he's probably going to go over. If he's if he's good, he's going to try to go up and down on you, right on your head. He might even call his assist and go up and down on you. Don't press a button; just block. If you're not Magneto, just block. If you're Magneto, what you have to learn is which of these options beat the others. Okay? Um, if you try to go low against a Magneto and Magneto goes up and down on you, he will hit you as you try to go low. He's going to double snap you. If you pressed your assist when you tried to go low, then you're going to get double snapped and, and, and your Psylocke is going to die or your assist character is going to die. Um, if Magneto tries to cross you up, you basically just want to try to block these things. Try to get away from Magneto. Try to uh, eliminate whatever Magneto is going to do with do for you unless you are a Magneto. Then you have to go learn how to fight it. So, you know, go figure out Magneto. But at the face-off, Magneto rules, okay? Next after Magneto, you have Sentinel, okay? Sentinel has super armor and he has little Sentinel gimmicky bullshit that he can pull on you. So you got to watch out. If you're not Magneto... And it's Sentinel. Hmm. Sentinel's probably going to dash back. Don't worry about Sentinel, actually. Scratch that. Sentinel, eh, he's not that scary. He, he's got some bullshit, but 
His his most threatening option probably he will try sometimes to jump straight up and do a jab jab overhead on you, um, and do a fast fight combo which can be fifty percent right off of your life very quickly. So at the face off, if you're fighting Sentinel, watch out for an overhead. Otherwise, you can probably press a couple of buttons, try to react to his maybe he'll try to super armor counter you with something. But usually you can make this safe. It's usually pretty safe to attack Sentinel is what I'm saying to you. But you gotta watch out for some of his tricks too. Uh, Storm and Cable, not as threatening. They can't do as much damage to you with one meter is the main thing here. Um, interestingly enough, Storm and Cable at the face-off are pretty even. They, you'll often see if, it's a, if a Storm and a Cable face-off, they'll trade low hits, low jabs, and the low shorts are the same speed. Um, this, is, this is assuming you switch glitch your character. Always switch glitch your character in first because then you get access to your fastest light attack. And everything is based from the fact that you have one light attack that is as fast as possible. Um, that kind of gives everything a nice base. So, you know, you know that Storm can never go low against Magneto from the face-off because if Magneto goes low and Storm goes low, then Magneto's going to win. If Magneto goes up, down, and the Storm goes low, Magneto's going to win. If, Storm, if Magneto crosses up and Storm goes low, Storm's, Magneto's going to win. So, you know, S Storm basically never wants to press any button at the face-off against Magneto. You want to block and then call your, your anti-air assist and get the hell away from him. Um, uh, so Storm and, and Cable... Against each other, they'll often trade. Um, Cable has to watch out for Storm doing a tri-dash like Magneto on his head. Storm can do those things. They're not as deadly, but she does have access to them. Um, they can both uh, face off against Sentinel with uh, J Cable do jab and then do fierce guns. The Sentinel doesn't have much for that. Storm will often try to just jump on Sentinel and do something stupid. Uh, nothing of real substance there, but the, f the fact is that um, once you get away from Magneto, um, you know, the face-off opens up a little bit more. You have a little bit more options. You just have to watch out for Magneto going low, high-low, or the cross-up. And once you can get away from that, that's, that's really how you can win. Um, this will actually move me into my next section on um, uh, what team you want to play. Um, <laughs> what team you want to play. Um, there's, I would like to say, a few prototypical players that play each team um, that are good to watch out for. And, I, and also, you know, each team is a good approach to just learning this game because um, I feel like there's a, a style that is associated or maybe sometimes a couple of styles that's associated with these teams and I feel like if you want to excel in a game you need to all, all that you can bring to the game at the, at, the, at the end of the day is your style and you have to accept the parameters um, that uh, on upon which the game is being played, you know, you you, you have to jump if you're going to play football. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you can kick a soccer ball, you know, very accurately. You know, it just it's not a factor in the game. So you have to accept what field this game will be played upon and uh, adapt to that. So um, jumping into Marvel, you know, you know, bring your style. No, Switch Glitch is not illegal in tournaments. It never has been, and it probably never will be because it is such an integral part of the game. I would not have spent um, five minutes or however long that was explaining it if it wasn't something that's used in tournaments. It's a big, huge part of uh, tournament play. Um, I guess maybe there's one thing to know about that. Not everyone uses a Switch Glitch, but probably 90% of players do. You don't have to use the Switch Glitch to get the fastest attack, and there's a debate about whether you can beat the switch glitch the switch glitch being switching a character that is not the first character on the team into the first position of the team during the loading screen after selecting a character this will change obviously it the character that was loaded um and causes some glitch where the character that was loaded into the first slot only has to hold the attack button to get their first attack button rather than um, pressing it with per perfect timing. So if you 
quick example, you, you want to play Magneto, Storm, Psylocke. You pick Storm, Magneto, Psylocke. Okay, then you switch Magneto in, and then you have Magneto, Storm, Psylocke. When the fight starts, you switch Magneto by holding the assist one button while the screen load, while the virtual screen loads. Magneto starts, you hold uh, crouch and light kick, and the light kick will come out as fast as possible, theoretically. Um, there's been debate about whether that light kick can be beat um, with just a perfectly timed button press. I don't know if these, if there were any conclusive results. I don't think there were. But whatever, that's not really important. Um, some people just have really good timing anyway, so they don't worry about the switch glitch, because uh, people that who, who played in the arcade repeatedly did, weren't able to use it uh, as much. And, you know, they played the game a lot before before the Switch glitch came out. No, the PS3 and Xbox 360 version do not get rid of the Switch glitch. Um, it's only not possible online because you can't switch your characters after you choose them online, I suspect, because they begin to load immediately after you select them. That's why the game slows down. Um, if you play these versions offline, then the Switch glitch is completely intact. I don't... I, I mean, supposedly the Switch glitch banned at EVO, I don't know, but I was at EVO, and I played Marvel, and I definitely used the Switch glitch, so there you go. Um, right, so you bring your style to the game, you know, you bring who you are, you want to express yourself as a player, you know, as an Eastern way to put it, kind of zen, you can, you can be the game, alright, of the game, be, be in the game, but not of the game, um, so you can pick a team, I think, that, a, that suits your style, and that's a good way to jump in. So, um, the main teams, some of the main teams we have in Marvel, uh, as we talked about last week, um, MSP, right? That's your traditional classic. That's actually, you know, your your essential, quintessential rushdown team in all of video games. You know, even when you look at Mortal Kombat 2, and you, and you see Kung Lao or something, people look at that and it's like, wow, he's rushing down like Magneto, you know, and that game came out a decade before Marvel or whatever, not, not quite a decade. But um, MSP, Magneto, Storm, Psylocke, all on the A assist, whichever that first one is, Magneto does EM Disruptor, Storm does Typhoon, uh, Psylocke does her anti-air assist, uh, crucial to that team. This team excels in um, mobility, um, speed, um, really, really capable of um, con constant resets, high damaging resets, confusion tactics, whatever you want. Like, this team, you can basically, if, if, if you can think of it, you can do it, is, is a, sort of a way you could put it. Um, you want to look at players like um, Mixup, who was one of the first players to take this team and do that infinite, that ROM infinite um, of the shorts, repeated looped shorts, and using that, and doing maybe just a quick reset into uh, a Psylocke assist. The power of this team, one of the main powers of the team, is the reset into the Psylocke assist into the Tempest, unmashable. Um, you know, classically, Magneto would combo into a Hypergrav, into a Tempest. People found out that you could mash out of that combo consistently, and it became obsolete. The next uh, evolution of Magneto was these resets into unmashable Tempests, and then possibly a DAC in a storm, quick guard break, and then killing characters. So, MSP, look up old mix-up videos for just straight basic. He was the first person, one of the, really the first players to just take that style and uh, make it successful. Um, as we mentioned, Sue Mighty, um, another player who's uh, an incredible Magneto Storm Psylocke player. His Magneto is, is really definitive of what can be done just with uh, the pure mobility of the character. He moves at angles that it's nearly impossible for other people to replicate 
and at like safe, precise speeds. He lands hits in situations that uh, other players would struggle in, and he converts on these hits big time. So uh, always check out some Sue Mighty if you're trying to figure out how to uh, jump on to MSP. Um, and, and then more recently, we have um, Chris Schmidt, who kind of took uh, the, the Marvel world. Um, I mean, he was, he was a staple, uh, placing top eight at, at uh, almost every Evo, but uh, he kind of came into his own last year and uh, t- took MSP to the, t- to the top at the season's beatings tournament which was an epic Marvel vs. Capcom 2 tournament. And I think at that tournament, he beat Yipes in the finals. And, of course, Yipes, um, the MSP, the first guy to put the theoretical MSP into practice, I want to say, where he is one-hit killer personified. Um, That's what really this team has that other teams... Um, lack or what this team has um, you know over other teams it really excels in the one hit kill because of the the high ambiguity of the resets available and just how tough it is to block these things and the high rewards you know it's they, it makes the team makes you uh, scared to press a button or, or it makes you scared into mashing your uh, anti-air assist. And that can just make it more dangerous for you because that can result in a double snap. But even if it doesn't result in a double snap, you can get snapped. And then if the MSP is uh, proficient, then the incoming character can, uh, can, go for a, can get taken for a ride right there, so to speak. MSP, that's your, that's your Rushdown team. Check out Mixup, Sue, Schmidt, Krishna, and Yipes. Go to ZachD.com slash MVC2 because there are plenty of videos on all these players. Next, Sandthrax. Um, this team is the other MVC2 team, uh, the decaf of the, you know, Marvel 2 coffee world. MSP is obviously the caffeinated version. Um, yeah, um, Sandthrax, Storm uh, on the Typhoon Assist, Sentinel on the Drone Assist, uh, Capcom on the uh, frickin' Captain Corridor Assist, Anti-Air Assist. This team is bi- built for um, really uh, safety and uh, big damage. Um, these things don't normally go together, but that's one of the reasons why this team is so good. Um, you have two really good duos, and, and you have one of the most powerful duos in the game, um, Storm, or rather, I'm sorry, Sentinel Capcom. Um, on MSP, um, sorry if I didn't mention, but you always start Magneto. That's why that team is called MSP. Sandthrax, you have a little bit more of a flexi- You have a little more flexibility. You have the option of starting Storm or Sentinel, according on the situation. But this team is good for players who can, who have um, me- medium level, who have a little bit of uh, execution, and are, are want to get to a really high level. Um, and and are able to uh, employ some high level techniques. Are ready to like really kind of jump into this, because with uh with when you have Sentinel and Capcom, you're really gonna have to at some point learn the intricacies of fast flights. Storm on this team, she exists mainly for the DHC and maybe to run away from Magneto, play a defensive zoning game, but. What this team excels in is its ability to really hurt you with Sentinel Capcom. Okay, um, Capcom is generally relegated to the assist role in this team, as Psylocke is generally relegated to the assist role on the MSP team. But you would notice that if you were to check out some videos of some really good Sandthrax players like Sanford Kelly, who Sandthrax is named after, obviously. Um, He's been uh, around the scene for a long time. He's used many different teams, but he's definitely um, a Sandthrax player to check out. His Sentinel and Sentinel-Capcom combo are uh, just uh, amazing to watch. 
his Sentinel looks like it's in custom combo mode all the time because it seems like he converts every little tap into a huge combo uh, effortlessly. Um, another player who's also uh, strong strong with the Sandthrax aggression would be Chunksta. Check him out anytime, uh, maybe after the year 2005 when he really came into his own in this game. He's his Sentinel, I want to say, his Sentinel is definitely among the best Sentinels. And there's really nothing else that, that I really need to say about that, I guess. But he has one of the best robots um, that you could witness. So just check out his movement, his control, and uh, the way that he converts little hits into big damage as well um, in every opportunity. And uh, if you want to take this team and play it with a more defensive style and uh, maybe do a little bit more of a, a, a simplistic game, um, combos that aren't as uh, flashy, just a little bit more straight to the point, then uh, check out Eric Arroyo, Smooth Viper. His style is, I would say, not as flashy, but it's just as effective, very straight to the point, and you've seen him make top eight with that style at Evolution. So you know that... Uh, it's serious. He's a, he he focuses on zoning. I would say a little bit more than other care, than other players, and uh, doesn't like to risk a lot when um, he doesn't need to. So if you um, if if this style appeals to you, check him out. Uh, what other teams do we have? Um, team Scrub. That's Team um, Sentinel, Cable, and uh, Capcom. Um, you can start Cable on this team. Prefer most people will prefer to move Cable out of that stop that starting slot against Magneto teams. And what's nice about that is you always know when the other guy is going to start Magneto because they're never going to put Magneto second. So that's kind of an, a, an inherent advantage to any team where you have Sentinel and you want to switch him. Um, just go ahead and throw him first against Magneto team, and then common tactic just to dash back or just block at the face off. Look out for his overheads. Um, and then you can uh, take control with your standard Sentinel play, which you would see in some videos of great uh, Team Scrub players. Now, uh, as far as great Team Scrub players, again, Santhrax, uh, Sanford Kelly comes up. Uh, he does not use the team consistently, but when he does, his cable is really nice to watch. Uh, Randy Liu, I would say, is uh, one of the greater... Team Scrub players, but his Sentinel always left a little bit to be desired. So check out his cable play, the way that he places grenades, the way that he uh, does his his pattern of, um, of screen control with the jump back fierce, calling the drones to cover himself, and um, uh, on reaction making his opponents block or uh, block a Viper Beam to get some meter and chip them down. Um, very strong at that. Other scrub players, ah, my mind sort of escapes me. Well, yeah, you get the picture. Uh, moving on, Matrix, there's a team, um, Storm on the Typhoon Assist, Sentinel on the Drone Assist, Cyclops on the Anti-Air Assist. Uh, this guy and I talked about this team. Uh, you really only see Justin win with this team, so if you see Justin winning the finals of a tournament, there's a good chance that he used this team. Watch him. It's some otherworldly shit. Uh, it's one of the things about this team is I think that um, not a lot of players play Cyclops, so once a player gets to Justin in the finals, they're not necessarily ready for the speed at which Cyclops comes out. Um, the difference between this team and the aforementioned Sandrax it's easier for a Magneto to maneuver against Capcom assist than it is against a Cyclops assist, and that makes all the difference. Um, Capcom assist, once Magneto gets into a rhythm, as long as he is moving forward, Capcom assist doesn't really have a shot in getting him. You know, you, you get a feel for when Capcom's coming out, and you can quickly dash over him or move away, or whatever the case may be, and then punish him, uh, you know, lift him up a little bit and keep him on the screen so that he's not able to be called again. And um, as Magnetos get better, they're able to really handle the Capcom assist. Um, the same cannot be said as easily for Cyclops. He comes out um, 
uh, he, his hitting, where he hits is bigger than Capcom. He comes out and hits faster than Capcom. He's harder to stuff. He's harder to avoid. He puts the bullet on screen that's invisible and goes further. So it's um, harder for even Storm to run away from. And one of the uh, the great things about this team is he sets up unblockables for Sentinel. So if you can play um, even more defensively and you really like Storm, and you wanna, you know, you wanna try to control the whole screen with just her, and uh, you don't wanna do a lot of crazy flashy sentinel combos, but you're ready to kind of hold it down with him. Then, um, you know, think about this team. The Cyclops assist makes it, uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit away from your ability to do to do high damage in combos, but he, uh, what you what you uh, give up. Right there, you, you gain in screen control and positioning. Um, break right here. Thing about this, these teams, like we, like we said before, if you want to get super crazy and creative, you can throw in other characters on these teams. But these are the basic teams, I want to say, that will take you far. So look at the characters on these teams and uh, maybe swap out uh, a similar style of character if you wanna if you want to build... A powerful team, but these are the the sort of classic definitions of really successful teams. Um, it's not just the characters; uh, a lot of it is the order, and you see a lot of commonalities. Um, you'll see Storm or Sentinel in the second position a lot. That safe DHC or a high damaging DHC, um, respectively, um, is what is. Uh, so desired in one of the in the formation of the team. So definitely look um, at all aspects of the formations of these teams. You know, if you want to try and and play your marrow, then you know maybe you want to take out Storm and put in marrow, and then you still can try to DHC into Sentinel, or maybe you want to DHC from marrow into Storm, something like that. Create a team that can utilize the greater aspects of the Marvel engine, and a lot of that is going to be done with these um, basics. Moving back to my team analysis, just a few teams left. Um, MSS, Magneto, Storm, and Sentinel. Okay, This is um, Magneto on the A-Assist, Storm on the A-Assist, and Sentinel on the A-Assist, the Rocket Punch. Um, you may have seen this team on the Drones Assist. I don't necessarily endorse that team. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it for a second briefly just to cover all bases. But mainly the thing about this team, I want to say it's um, MSP, but with a cannon behind you. You know, um, you can you got a little bit of oomph. Um, MSP is a finesse team at the highest level, um, although it is... You know, like I said, you can do almost anything with it. Um, you know, that it doesn't come for free. You know, you have to work for those things. This team, you um, you get a little bit more of a big trump card with your rocket punch assist that takes a little bit of the pressure off of the execution woes, um, just because you don't have to do as many resets to kill someone. Um, the resets that you get are not as uh, elaborate. You don't have uh, as many options just because uh, the way that Psylocke hits, she comes out, she hits all around. You can be a little bit more creative with that. But this team, um, it's straight to the point. You want to try to bang someone with a rocket punch assist and maybe reset them once and bang them again, and right there you can kill them. So this team is for Magnetos who don't necessarily want to get all the, you know, mess with all the, the extra little pizzazz and the flair, but you want to rush someone down and kill them. Um, another thing about this team is that it is basically, it always has a comeback on it because there's always a DAC available that's going to do some damage, maybe even a triple DAC. Um, strong players with this team will often try to keep, will basically keep all three characters alive, even with just a sliver of life. Because even if you have a sliver of life, you can still do a ton of damage with a double or a triple DHC sometimes. Um, players that you want to look at on this team, remember, zacdcom slash MVC2. J. Marr, that's Justin Marr from Seattle. Uh, we called him Mr. Impossible when he came onto the East Coast because he took that, um, that uh, always there's a comeback with this team theory and totally put it into practice. 
he made more nail biting comebacks than almost any Marvel vs. Capcom 2 player in history, really, of anyone to think of. And that's saying a lot with Justin Wong in the scene. You know, Jay Marks. Yes. Yeah. Hey, um, what? <laughs> uh, just to tie in something you just said, Jay Mar is going to be actually part of um, the Marvel, the, Mar- the new Marvel uh, section on Alphaism. I thought you were going to say the new Marvel movie or something. Like, he's going to be in Mar- uh, Iron Man 2? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. No, we're going to have an Ask J. Mar part, um, thread on the Marvel section of Alphaism. And so if you okay. wanted to learn a little bit more about MSS, because that's his specialty, um, uh-huh. he's going to be the guy that you want to ask. Okay. Sounds good. Um, another uh, really strong MSS player, and you probably will see these guys doing a few battles if you if you look for some videos of them. Is Demon Heo from the Philadelphia hey. era, area? Jamar, as um, since Ben knows him, he's acquainted with him. He is from the Seattle area. Demon Heo from the complete opposite side of the country, but both of these players really strong with the MSS team. Um, this. I'm, I don't know what else to say about this team except uh, remember those DACs. Never let anyone die, if possible. There's always a comeback with a DAC. Um, team Rotron. You know, this one is uh, a little bit of an getting down to the unorthodox teams. I think that all the teams that I've listed are the teams that I consider the mostly orthodox teams. Um... Those are the the most basic forms of these teams. You know, there's some alternates that I didn't even you know mention. Like you can take Team Scrub, Cable Storm, uh, Capcom, and throw in Cyclops. You know, a very similar team. You know, um, but uh, these are the teams that you would see most commonly in the Marvel scene in the last five years after after the game kind of got figured out, so to say, so, uh, so to speak. What? Okay, so right. Uh, clock work anymore? What's that? Uh, uh, oh, right. Clock work no, you won't see that team very much. The, that's 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 less orthodox, I would say. So right, the, the, those are the these those teams are kind of the easiest to win with, the easiest to jump in with because they have huge um huge potential really across the board. There, there's always a comeback. Um, to, ver- to, to varying extent, but really any of them can come back. You know, like I said, MSS is great at it, but any of them can do it. Um, they all have like a great duo, or really they mostly have two good duos. You know, and and they all have like safe DHCs, um, which is something that's usually uh, key. If, if they don't have a safe DHC, then you know you have like the counter in with cable or something like that. You know, that's something that's big too because it lets you. It basically lets you play the game with two characters instead of necessarily one, and you, I'm, you know, it sounds kind of silly. You have three characters, but you might not get a chance to get to your next character if you don't have a safety AC. But you okay. basically, you, you know, you will if you get, you know, if you have Storm second, you can get Storm in pretty much, you know, if. If you got hit once and then you couldn't block anything, you know, whatever, you died. But if you get away for one second, you can just mash your, your super and then get Storm in there. And then, you know, chance, odds are very, very low that they can hit you out of it. They can do it sometimes if they really, 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 really deep in that ass. But so clockwork and with the spiral teams are dead now completely. completely. They're not dead. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to them, but uh, I wouldn't call them dead. I would just say that they're definitely less common. Okay. Um, so yeah, I got uh, yeah those those teams. Those are the common teams, and they're also common because they're the teams that rely on the big four characters. You know, the teams that don't rely on those big four characters are less common. All right. So um, Rotron obviously does rely on three of the best four characters, but it's in a you don't have a the, the really kind of to get out of jail free as much as you do with the other mo- uh, the, the the other teams. So that's one of the reasons why it's less common, uh, harder to a little bit harder to play this team because you need to be an expert of all three characters. I would say this is a Magneto on the A assist, which is the EM disruptor cable on the 
uh, anti-air assist um, Sentinel on the rocket punch assist. So you do get Magneto with his short, short rocket punches, strong damaging combos, strong damaging resets available. Um, secretly good with this team is you get you do get an anti-air with Magneto, and you know as opposed to the MSS team where you kind of got to rush it down. You can play a little bit more defensively with this team because you have an anti air assist. That's really nothing to sneeze at either. Um, but you can't. It's it's a lot harder to convert that anti air assist into big damage. But it's possible. So team row, Magneto, Cable, uh, Sentinel. Look at Rodolfo, obviously, and look at Justin Long, probably the other best player of this team. He adopted it after he had you know this thrilling series of. The games at ECC with Roe, and then he kind of started using it at different points in tournaments. Um, Can I ask a question on that? With it. Hey, yeah. hey um, what order do you recommend to play? Because I remember when that, when I team when Roe first started using that team, didn't he play Magneto last? It no. Was like, it, or I remember something like where he like was like Sentinel Cable. Sentinel it's Sentinel Max or something okay, like that. Okay, so, so Rotron is Magneto, Cable, Sentinel, and then there's the reverse row, Sentinel, Cable, Magneto. Mm-hmm. This team is preferred in this, the team is preferred in this order when you're fighting a Magneto, essentially. Because, uh-huh. like, like I said before, you know, you might want to, on, on Team Scrub, you might want to throw in Magneto there for, or throw in Sentinel against the other Magneto, because you know that they're going to play Magneto, and Sentinel is a favorable fight against Magneto. So the thing is, with that team, I mean, with, with Team Row, if you start Magneto and you're fighting against, say, MSP, you have a hard time in the Magneto-Magneto fight because the other Magneto can kind of just do, can, can do short-short, call his assist, and then kind of go crazy. Um, and it's much harder for you to, to get him out of your face because he can try dash over top of your um, cable at such an angle that it makes it really hard for your cable to um, to hit him as an anti-air assist, and you know your your sentinel assist is not going to be an anti-air. They're going he's, he's going to be able to you know j- jump on that guy's head all day. So you know you have to play a really clean Magneto, but if they have a really clean like Magneto Stylock, then they can you know almost make it impossible for you to really find an opening to convert into something big. Now, if you start Sentinel, you know, you can do, like I said, with, you know, the scrub and just kind of avoid that first hit and get the hell out of there. And then you can get into the basic Sentinel gameplay of doing your spit fly on fly, which is, you know, almost, um, for, you know, uh, riskless against the Magneto at full screen. And you have the benefit of Magneto beam assist, which does really well against um, a Magneto and the Psylocke, okay, because if he recklessly calls his Psylocke, you can beam him and then catch him with the Psylocke, I mean, catch him with your, your EM disruptor assist and then, like, beam him again from full screen and do a lot of damage and not have to risk very much. Oh, so yeah. that's the reason why you'll see him re- use the reverse row a lot to against um, a Magneto team. Lockdown, um, assist punishing, really big, really strong. Um, yeah, so that's Team Row. Um, moving on, Strider Doom. I've heard y'all clamoring for it in the room, or I've read you. Um, this team, <laughs> it's called Strider Doom because it's like, who's the third character? I don't know, right? It's, this team is so strongly based around Strider Doom that the third character is, 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 um, Almost an afterthought. Um, it, it, oh God, no! It ends up being <laughs> it ends up being the most important part of the team because with this team you're locked into a game plan with Strider Doom, okay? And that game plan, Strider Doom, is it's pretty much inescapable, right? It's pretty much airtight. Like we can we can go ahead and say that Strider Doom, you play it right, you do everything right and perfectly, you're good. All right, you know, there's going to be no holes. You can reset them with <laughs> inescapable resets, you know. You play that thing right, they they got nothing for you. But you made one small, tiny mistake, and it can be the whole game. And not just that. You need meter to fuel that anyway, right? So standard choice for this team a lot is to put Sentinel first, 
Okay, you put Sentinel first. It's like you got an extra character because Sentinel has the most life. You know, so just in terms of real value, you get the most bang for your buck. Um, he also happens to be one of the best characters, so it's not like you just took the guy with the with the most life, but he's not good. Like you, you know, you you picked a great character, and he's got a lot of life and shit, and he's he can fight. Small drawback with that though is that Sentinel doesn't synergize with these two characters like quite as great as he synergizes on some of his other teams. Um, he doesn't have access to strong, powerful, fast flights, um, and is more of a zoning thing. Um, and and that can actually be a problem for people trying to pick up this team because playing a team like that will often force you to burn a meter for safety and try to make someone block a hyper sentinel force and do some damage and maybe and and hope that they would get hit by this. That's a, a habit that you, you have to break when playing this team. If you want to play Strider Doom, then you got to be down to be doing some flashy shit. Like, if you want to play Team Row, you're going to have to do some cool, thoughtful things, but you can, you can kind of play a little bit basic. You know, like I said, you can play defensively. Um, if you play Strider Doom, like, you will have to do some flashy, cool shit. You will have to play almost perfectly you will have to play incredibly thoughtfully but if you are able to do all these things then once you are in your zone you won't have to be scared because you know when the assist is coming out and how to block it and how to continue to follow up and all that okay, this this team is um you know it's can i ask a question it's right quick? Of like, what uh okay so on when sentinels on I mean, point is there uh -huh. any? Is, I mean, there is there any shenanigans he can use with Doom as an assist? Um, what you want to do with Sentinel and Doom is lock them down with your spits and your flight patterns as you would normally with Sentinel, and use your Doom assist to cover you, um, to cover your spits, make them a little bit safer. Um, chip them for free chip damage, maybe hit them and hit them for some damage. But the thing about that is um, you can't necessarily convert any stray Doom Assist hit into damage with Sentinel. And you can't be greedy and go for it when you weren't going to get it because a lot of times that can be the game. All right, like You want to not get too gutsy with Sentinel on this team because remember, you know, you, it may, it might be going great for you with Sentinel and Doom, okay? But you still got Sentinel Doom, all right? If they try to ash on you one time, one good time, and you weren't ready for it, yo, I know that those rocks were holding you down, but, but in a clutch situation, yo, Doom is gonna come out and get kicked in the head, and he's like, yo, yo, you're like, yo, Doom, like, I thought you had the powers of the Beyonder for a minute. Like, you got all these rocks and shit. You got, you got a cape and shit. Yo, you, you, I thought you was tough, dog. You like one of the strongest characters in the Marvel Universe, and you just got kicked in the head, yo. And he's like, I don't know, man. He's, my suit is metal. I should have took the helmet off. Magneto just got up in my face, okay? So you got to remember with well, Sentinel and Doom, you want to get these meters. And when you're ready, when the going gets tough, it's a good chance to get, a, get the hell out. If you got the meters, whatever, like, get the hell out, okay? And get get Strider in there and do the real work. Because, you know, you're not playing Sentinel Doom. You're playing Strider Doom, and Sentinel's there. I'm not saying take, take Sentinel out when he's being the MVP or whatever, but I'm just saying, you know, watch out. Do you play Sentinel until he dies, or do you or you, or you play him until he gets a little health, and then you just... No. You need, actually, rookie mistake with this team, yo, Sentinel Assist is almost necessary. Um, if you're really, really, really good, you'll be able to just hack it with Strider Doom after Sentinel dies, right? But Strider's, I mean, for, for starters, if you ever let a character die in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, um... You pro you fucked up. <laughs> like, uh, there's really no what like way for me to put it otherwise. Like, 
that's why that's why I'm saying you need a safe DHC or, or you know yeah you you basically need a safe DHC because if you let a character die then the next character that's going to come in is going to get guard broken in some way shape or form you know and if it's versus Magneto then the next character should be dead if it's versus Iron Man then the next character should be dead um, if it's versus Strider and he has three meters, then the next character should be locked down. If it's the next character and it's versus Cable and Cable has three meters, he should be dead. You know. So if you let somebody die, I you, up. you you fucked up. You got a problem. So okay. you want to get these guys out before that's gonna happen. Um, that's why I'm saying with Sentinel and Doom, it can happen really quickly. Especially if it's versus Magneto, because you know you're you're zoning him fine. See, like if if you're fighting Storm, you have um, you can always tell basically how much damage she can do at any given time. Okay, if she's got one meter, all she can do is do a random hailstorm, and you're Sentinel. All right, so it's like, oh, okay, that hurt, but I'm cool. You know, if it's if it's a uh, if it's Cable. And he's got two meters, and you got whole life. You got all your life, and and your doom has all his life. You can still be doing what you were doing. You don't you don't want to be reckless, but you can be doing what you were doing because even at, at worst, he could light you up for two bars, and then and then he has no more bars, and then you can bring Strider in. All right, but Magneto does not need any bars. <laughs> like you can't you can't look at him and tell how much he's about to do to you. He might just kill you. He might just roll over there and hit you with a good try dash when you call Doom and get the double snap right there and like for no meter and for well, well for one meter and for nothing he's gonna kill you. But even with no meter he's still just as deadly, you know. So you have to consider these things. You always, always, always want to move your character safely. If you don't, if you let a character die, consider that next character dead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Consider them dead, dude. Don't let don't let's don't let Sentinel die. Another thing about this team, Strider Doom with Sentinel on it, is that the Sentinel assist does one really, really important thing that Doom doesn't for Strider. And that is give you free combos off of teleport mix ups and shit. Right? Whereas if you call Doom a lot of times like if you only have Doom then you can't just, like, call Doom and, like, do something janky and make them get hit by Doom and then just hit them off of Doom, right? That's kind of like a standard Marvel strategy, you know? Call your assist, do something funny, and cross somebody up, like, once, twice, or three times or whatever, you know, and, and, hope they, and make them get hit by the assist, combo off the assist. Can't do that so much with Doom because they bounce off of the rocks, right? And you can't... You can't capitalize off of that as much. You have to try to super jump up and do something crazy, and that's going to be scaled. It's not going to do a lot of damage because they probably got hit by like a good number of rocks. So that's not going to be good. Maybe you can, um, you know, they'll get popped up by the rocks, and you'll get the nice little like dash under. You know, you can try to like cross them under and reset them, but obviously that's blockable or something. So if you have Sentinel left, and you know you call drones and you teleport or something and mix them up. Then they get hit by the drones, dot, dot, dot. You still have time to run up, hit them with a full combo. And then you're going to get your full meter off of that. And then you can do your knockdown, call your orbs, and then do your lockdown with Doom and put Doom in the role that he's supposed to be in. So if you keep Sentinel on that team, that's one of the main reasons, too, why Sentinel's good on this team. Because even if Sentinel only has, you know, 30, 40% life, you know, you can still do that with him. So he's a good role player on that team. So what about um, Spiral? Wait, I'm not there yet. Um, so, so of course you want to look at Clockwork for this team. This is basically Team Clockwork. Um, this is Team Clockwork. So look up Clockwork, and that's C L O C K W zero R K. And remember, ZachD.com slash NBC two. Um, all right, I forgot to do my uh, NPR thing. This is Alphaism Radio. Uh, 
Time has just crossed over, so it's uh, Monday, August 17th on the East Coast. We started uh, about two hours ago. Uh, this is MVC2 In-Depth Part 2. Um, this Scott was unavailable tonight, so it is just me going solo, giving my MVC2 primer to those who want to play. I'm here it's with... Marvel, baby. It's Marvel, baby. I'm here with Bunk A and Shin Blanca, and we are just uh, going down the list of playable Marvel teams and dropping hints, dropping tips, dropping tactics for these nah, teams. man, I'm just sitting here learning with your <laughs> Dr. Phil um, impersonation on Marvel. It's very, very good, sir. I, I like that. Thanks. All right. So uh, finished up Shrider Doom. Um, I didn't actually write down the Spiral team, so I'll throw in Spiral right now. Oh, damn. I can't throw in Spiral right now. I forgot one of the Orthodox teams. Somebody's going to kick me for this. Um, the least, most, but still Orthodox, Orthodox team, I, guess? I think, is Storm Sentinel. Okay, what? Oh, okay. No, that wasn't Sorry. it. Go ahead. What was your guess? I was going to thought you were going to do MST. Fuck no. <laughs> that is not an orthodox team. That is a that is that is like that I don't that's not a real team yet. I mean, that team was good, you know. I give credit to Mix Up for taking that team and taking Magneto Storm Psylocke and making it um making it play making him playable, but you know, they they're, they're not they're not orthodox teams. They're not common teams. They're they're best serving roles, um, and, and um, doing specific things. But but you know, don't sneeze at MST. That is a deadly team. There's a lot of things you can do with that team. I just don't want to go into it as one of the re- regular teams. Like I I wouldn't tell someone jumping into Marvel to main that team. Um, but I would tell them to main any of these teams that I'm talking about. So, Storm Sentinel Cable, right? That is kind of like the Rotron of Storm Sentinel teams. Because, like, like Rotron is the Rotron of Magneto teams, because it's like a weird Magneto team. And then this team is the weird Storm Sentinel team, because you get the weird anti-air cable, where he... He doesn't. He doesn't do what Cyclops does, which is, or, or he doesn't do what Cyclops nor Capcom do, and is so far as being a panic button, being able to just kind of call him at will, and him being like a really infallible anti-air. But he's a pretty good anti-air. Cable is. It's he's passable, definitely. He does the damn thing, okay. And this team. I want to say is for someone that has a Storm Sentinel mindset, but wants to play really defensively. Um, if you don't like Magneto, then play this team. This team does pretty well against Magneto because um, this is this is kind of high level right here. But here's the thing: this team nobody can get snapped in, right? Because uh, anybody that gets snapped in is still a threat to Magneto. You, th- you snap in Sentinel, he's a Sentinel, he's scary. You snap in Cable, you snapped in Cable, and he has meter, definitely, because he's in the third spot. So, like, there's going to be a little bit of a little fracas or whatever. Cable comes in, he's got meter. So, anybody that comes in is threatening. thing about that is, is like I said, um, well, not quite like I said. If a character dies, you fucked up. Likewise, if a character gets snapped, you fucked up too, because Magneto... His goal is to kill that guy that comes in. Now, he had to work for it, and he might get it. But you playing Storm Sentinel Cable are kind of relying on the fact that Magneto is going to mess up his guard break. Because if he does, you can still win. And you're in the best position to win versus pretty much any other team. You know, if if it was Cable, or, or sorry, if it was Capcom, or if it was Cyclops in that spot... They have much farther to go than Cable, who comes in now with a drone assist. That's a deadly duo. And he has, at some point, a Hailstorm DHC available. So this team is strong from the forward position and the backwards position. Um, it's um, Storm and Sentinel. You, wanna, you would want to play it really safe. Um, chip damage with Hail and 
take free damage when when you frustrate an opponent and can get them with your perfectly ranged stand roundhouse. Don't necessarily DHC unless you're going to kill like Magneto. This team is kind of the Storm Sentinel team that's the anti-Magneto. Because after Magneto dies, you still have a force that can reckon with the remainder of the, any of the Magneto teams. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of teams will um, take out Magneto on like an MSP or an MSS. And then they still have the Storm Psylocke, which will make the BS comeback, or the Storm Sentinel, which will make the Mr. Impossible BS comeback, the, the even faster BS comeback. Um, this team, against this team, that's much harder, just because um, with Cable around, you can't recklessly call assists. Um, so yeah, players of this team that I think you would want to look out for are Harry Potter, um, or you know, a.k.a. Robust Potter. Um, robust. That's he, he. He used that name. He's been using that name for a long time. If you look under tournament results, you know zacky.com slash mbc2, and you're looking for his videos, you're probably gonna need to look up robust for the more recent stuff. But I don't know. I don't know. He, go, he uses both. Um, and then the other guy I think that uses this team the best is Sanford Kelly again. <laughs> this guy came up three times already. Um. But he he really used that team against Magnetos for a while with um, a, a large degree of success. Um, look at look at the way that um, Cable Assist is utilized and getting damage in a hailstorm. The timing on that one is kind of tight, but once you get it, it's really not that bad and it's really really useful. You don't really get it quite as easily off of a off of a, a Capcom Assist, which is kind of nice. Um, you can kind of you can confirm Cable being hit and land um, a hailstorm on the other character, whereas um, on Capcom, you would have to predict Capcom hitting and getting a hailstorm in, um, in a, in a follow-up after that. So that's one of the really strong things about um, this team with the cable and the anti air position. So one of the things to look out for, check out that team. <sighs> Just a couple teams left now. I know I said that before, but uh, I lied. <laughs> um, but now it's actually only a couple teams left. Um, spiral, spiral cable sentinel is a spiral team that you want to play if you're playing a spiral team. Thing about this team that um, the reason why this team is the best spiral team probably. Um, spiral's obviously a battery, one of the strongest batteries in the game. She has methods of um, Rushing down safely for low damage with her knives. Uh, they used to call it the knife cloud offense in Japan or the wall of swords here. It's because um, you really make the swords fight for you and you keep Spiral safe. Um, some of the best Spiral players, um, you basically see them after 60 seconds into the fight. They still have all their life and it's just so frustrating. Um... You get the cable. The you get the cable. Um, you don't have a safe, eh, a super safe DAC here. You can, you know, triple DAC to Sentinel. DACing the Sentinel is not always safe, but sometimes it's safe. So you can kind of make do with that. But you have um, safe tag techniques with this team, which is something that's kind of gone out of Marvel play. But you can tag your character out safely by doing certain things like um, with Spiral you throw out a bunch of knives and then tag immediately and then the last knife will come out just over top of your tag so if someone tries to like hit your character or whatever they'll get hit by the knife and you can come in safely um, you can you can do the same thing with Sentinel and his roundhouse drones um, that's one of the things that you'll need to rely on with this team to get around because otherwise um, you'll need to burn maybe three meters to get in Sentinel, and you definitely don't want to do that because you got Cable second, and Cable's role is to come into this fight with five meters and light up your life. Um, um, the other thing that you get that's uh, especially strong with this team is countering in Cable um, into his Air Hyper Viper Beam Super and, and doing a lot of damage that way into the Air Hyper Viper Beam Loop. Commonly, you get that with this team because Spiral, again, a strong battery. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All right, and Spiral uh, is. 
um, often on like the other side of the screen and will kind of frustrate uh, the other guy into calling their assist a lot or doing something that just kind of lock spiral down, make her block, try to hit the limbs. Uh, spiral will force the other guy to press a lot of buttons to get in. Um, so this generally will grant an opening for Cable to come in there with his air hyperviper beam super and do what he's supposed to do. Am I still here? Yeah. Um, okay. So, right, spiral cable on the anti-air assist and learn the counter in and cancel into air hyper viper beam. And then sentinel on the drone assist, use spiral on the projectile assist because um, once she's tagged out, she aids the cable in doing chip damage, which is probably the, the hidden strength of this team. Um, look at Duck Doe play this team and look at old videos of Ricky Ortiz. And other than that, really, the prototypical spiral is Ducto, of course, but there's definitely some footage out of him. And look at how he is not afraid to use five meters and call out a spiral assist with every super and chip someone down for 50%. Um, just the way that he does it, he, he'll call spiral just before your hyperviper beams and... That way, Spiral will come out after the Super Flash. He always makes it all the way across the screen while the other guy's blocking. Um, those projectile, that projectile does a, a ton of chip damage because it's like six hits separately spun together. You know, it's ridiculous. Um, so you you can uh, loop your air hyper rubber beams even if blocked and do a good 50% damage for with no retaliation. The other guy is totally screwed in that situation and they can't they can't do anything. Um, and a lot of a lot of times if you're fighting you know a Magneto an MSP team, just taking out one character can change out change the whole game. A lot of times they have a character that's red or on life support, and that the whole game for them is maintaining that character while they rush down safely. You know, they have this dual purpose of, okay, I have to go hit them with Magneto or I have to go hit him with, you know, with Storm or something, but I also have to keep Psylocke safe right now or I also have to keep Storm safe right now because I was calling Psylocke too, a, a little bit too much and she got punished or I tried to call Storm and be, and have a projectile to safely follow me across the screen as I dashed with Magneto and then she got hit, you know, and I, and I didn't expect it. And, and when she gets hit, she gets hit big. So, you know, um, just taking out one character with um, that strong technique of chipping someone down with the air hyper rubber beams that you'll get for building meter with Spiral is really strong. Something to keep in mind with... Um, the team that Duck Doe really made really made popular. Um, okay, just honorable mention: Team Watts, Blackheart, uh, Sentinel, and Capcom. There's, there's really nobody to watch on that team though, because nobody plays that team anymore. So if you want to blaze some trails, go watch some super old ass footage and then figure out how to adapt it to today. Or go hunt down Stiltman, Eric Foley, who worked on the Marvel vs. Capcom uh, HD version. So if you want to go ask him about Blackheart and as well complain about glitches, you know who to check out. Stiltman. Um, but right, and I, of course I, I haven't mentioned Iron Man, any Iron Man teams. And I gave a lot of respect to Iron Man. And I, I want to say that I don't know where to put Iron Man in this list where he's orthodox or unorthodox or common or uncommon because he's kind of experienced surges in the scene. He's like big for a couple of years, died out, big for a couple of years and died out. I didn't say dishonorable mention. I said it's an honorable mention. It's, but it's kind of dishonorable for, for Team Watts. Um... Sorry, I digress just talking to the chat room while I speak. Iron Man teams. Um, Iron Man, like I said, he's good because he fits on a lot of teams and a lot of positions. I guess if I had to pick an Iron Man team... I don't know. These are the Iron Man teams I like. Iron Man Cable Sentinel... Iron Man, Sentinel, Cyclops. 
Storm Sentinel Iron Man. And all these teams, you... Like, if you have... If you got Storm Sentinel Iron Man, you play Iron Man in the back, make him a fake anti-air. I mean, he's an anti-air, but he's, he's not a panic button, like Psylocke is. Um, what about what about Team Combo Fiend? Right. Yeah, right, right. That, that is definitely the... Right, Don. That's the Iron Man team, right? Because... He fits well. Right, I was going to get to the Magneto teams. You got Magneto, Iron Man, Psylocke, which was the old team combo fiend. And then he evolved it to um, Magneto, Iron Man, Sentinel. Uh, this team is played, it on diff- played on different assists. Some people would like to play the Sentinel on the drones because, you know, it gives you a little bit more... It gives you a, a, a few more options with Iron Man, who can be played as, a, you know, sort of a zoning character. Gives you a little bit more screen control. But uh, as of recent years, Team Combo Fiend, which is the Magneto, Iron Man on his uh, big repulsion blast assist, which is a lot of damage, and then uh, Sentinel has become Sentinel on the rocket punch assist. Um, and that way, the team functions a little bit more like the Team Rotron, um, but... You get this big, big, huge anti-air assist that kind of makes it difficult for players to get in on you a little bit more. Strength of see, the thing about Iron Man is he can fit in on basically a lot of regular teams. Like he's almost a big four character. He fits into the big four slots pretty like very interchangeably well. Um, he interchanges, he exchanges with with Cable on like Team Scrub. You can um. You can play like the the Iron Man Sentinel um, with an anti air because you get the DHC. The Iron Man has a really good DHC and a Sentinel. Um, you can play him in the back uh, on one of like the the the, the somebody Sentinel anti air teams. Make him an anti air. He'll replace Cyclops or Capcom. You get a little bit more for your pick because he's obviously a better fighter with his really, really easy infinite and uh, really, really high rewarding infinite. Um, I mean, his infinite can kill a team really more consistently than Magneto and with less work. Um, it's just that his anti air assist does not come out with as much. Um, I think it doesn't come out with as much invincibility as these other assists, but um, aside from that, m- most people just aren't used to fighting an Iron Man assist, and that that damn repulsor blast is really, really big. Um, it, it really messes with a lot of the Magneto's standard angles of approach, and if you just get one big, one repulsor blast assist that you're ready for, then you can juggle for huge damage with really any character. So, you know, Magnet or Iron Man fits in a lot of slots, you know, well. He can he can play a little bit aggressively um because one hit will reward you. It takes a, a little bit of creativity, definitely. He his tri dashes aren't as as twitch, aren't as hard to react to but they can still be used very effectively. And he can throw you into combos in the corner. I guess another common Iron Man team is um, the team that Elon plays, which is Iron Man Cable Doom. Hmm. Iron Man fits into a lot of slots. You know, Iron Man has um, a lot of roles. So I give a lot of love to Iron Man. I think he's a great, uh, very great, reliable, or a great viable character. Um, so check out... Um, you know, Combo Fiend, obviously, for Team Combo Fiend. Check out Fat Toy videos, who I believe was one of the best Iron Man players. Um, there's definitely a lot of other Iron Man players, though, that with videos. You can check out a lot of Japanese players, like Mitsu. Um, but also, definitely, definitely J360. Probably the most successful Iron Man, at least in the late era of Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Um... Or at least he did well at seasons beating the uh, three, which is big. So check out videos of him. He really took that one hit kill thing and, and made it reality too. Um, Can I ask a question? Um, 
My 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 question about Iron Man is, can he really fight against the top four one on one? Yeah. I mean, because he can. I, I mean, I look at him one on one. I just, I how do how do you actually, for example, how do you fight Cable with Iron Man? With well, you you jump up and throw some smart bombs, and you just kind of make your way across the screen and try to put him into the corner, like. Pff- like Iron Man is kind of somewhere in the middle of Cable and like you know the Magneto and the Storms you know he can do a little bit of what they can all do um, just not quite as well so but he has to vary it up depending on who he's fighting so if he's fighting Cable he's basically going to be dashing across the screen trying to get in a Cable's face and trying to call an assist and get a try dash or trying to land a throw in the corner into an infinite or trying to get like a random catch cable while he's jumping back and hit him with a floating jab and then combo him into infinite you know you're basically trying to do the same thing as magneto and trying to get up in there and land one hit into infinite um on the flip side against magneto or storm you got to play him a little bit more like a cable or a sentinel um you definitely want to zone them out a little bit more throw some throw your projectiles call uh, your projectile assists if you have any um, and just look for counter hits or you know countering hits hits that are going to hit them out of their attack opportunities because they're going to be coming at you hard you're going to have to block a lot and kind of try to find like little holes in their offense so I mean yeah he can um, but I don't, but I would also say that you don't want to put Iron Man really into the spot against the top four characters because his role, I mean, solo, because his role on the teams uh, usually don't pan out to that. Like I said, like if he's in the third slot, you don't really want, like, you know, if you have someone in the third slot, you don't want them to be fighting against someone from the first slot one-on-one anyway. You know, like, you, know, you, you, hope, you hope Capcom doesn't have to fight Magneto. So, but, but, you know, Iron Man does really well against any of the other third spot characters. If you have him in the first spot fighting against, like, a Magneto, then he's got some backup. And with backup, you know... That that's when he he can handle it. I would say a, a lot more effectively, a lot more reliably. Um, he doesn't do very great against Sentinel. Uh, it's very hard to hit Sentinel with Iron Man. Really, if Sentinel plays especially defensively, then um, Iron Man has to really go to great lengths to try to hit him. So that's one of the things you want to think about in constructing your team with Iron Man. Um, classic defense against Iron Man and the main reason why Iron Man really never caught on, my guess is that um, uh, Sentinels would just fly away from him and if you're not able to land that hit and take him in the infinite then you'll take a lot of damage on the way gotta be patient against that guy though but that's what a lot of characters have to do against him, just a little bit more so, you know, it's like I said, Iron Man goes both ways and in the fight against Sentinel Iron Man has to be Magneto, but he's slower. So he has to work even harder and be even more patient. But it's even more rewarding because the infinite is even easier and even more guaranteed. So you got that. There you go. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Because I think that was my end of my Marvel vs. Capcom 2 bit for tonight. I don't think I have any more teams. I don't remember any. That, that was rough. What do you, what, what do you, okay, this is, see, now, now, I can ask this for the newbie paper out there, because, I mean, I'm horrible at Marvel, so, I can ask some questions that most people don't mind. I mean, is it possible to get good at this game if you don't know how to play Sentinel? Yeah, but, I mean, you, yeah, but, like, what team, like, what team do you want to play? Like, you know, you can play MSP. I was playing Storm Cable, Storm Cable uh, Cyclops. Well, see, okay, you could play that team. You would definitely do better if you had Sentinel. But you can play that team. And that team has good synergy. That team can definitely work. It's just, um, 
it's just more work. Um, you have, you know, you have really good things with that team. You got a safe DHC. You have a good Annie Air. You have three good characters. It's just that that team. What is that team weak against? With that team, you are still kind of weak to Magneto because you can keep Magneto out, but it's harder. It's all on, like, if he gets through one little hole in your defense, then he's going to get you. But if you have Sentinel and you're keeping Magneto out, you, you have a little bit more freedom to put holes because you can just kind of fly away. But, like, with this team... You are probably the best. Like you're, you're, you're using Storm as on whatever assist you're, you're doing. You have her on to back up Cable, and you're using Cable to keep Magneto out usually. Um, and it's just hard. It's just dangerous because Magneto has so many ways to get in against Cable. You know he can catch you in the recovery of so many things that you do. Um, you know, like. That team, I would say, if you would, if you were to seriously play that team, definitely, you know, mess with the orders. Sometimes start Sentinel. I mean, or sometimes start Storm. Sometimes start Cable. Like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna play that team, you may as well just push your advantages. So, if you're fighting someone that you think is gonna start st uh, Sentinel, go ahead and start s Cable and try to lock them down a little bit and build some meters. Um, if you think they're gonna start uh, Magneto, you might want to just start Storm and try to run away. Um, but you know, I, like that team can work. I, I also like you know, I, I like Cable Storm Doom. I think that's a pretty decent team, and that team does pretty well against Magnetos. Whereas Cable Storm Cyclops does good against like Sentinels. Cable Storm Doom does pretty well against like Magnetos because it's like I said, you know, Magneto can get in there and 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 get through Doom. But it's a little bit harder with, if you have Cable um, with Doom. If you're really, really good with Cable, you can set up, you can put grenades in places and kind of cover Angle's attack. Whereas with Sentinel, you would be like moving and trying to get away from Magneto in these situations. But with 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 uh, with um, Cable and Doom, you can do a lot to uh, a Magneto before he ever really gets a chance to get in there and do something. Um, Significant, and if he pops off of one of those rocks once, this is what um, the Magni, what, what Sentinel Doom doesn't have, what Cable Doom has. If they pop off the rocks, you know you're gonna get a shot. It's like, it's just like Pringles, you know, once you pop. Um, so I think that like if you know, yeah, you can, you don't have to, you you can be pretty decent at this game without playing Sentinel. You might want to pick up a couple teams or something like that. Um, and and like I said, like if you if you're working with Cable Storm and the anti air slot, then that's you know that's that's not a bad that's not a bad team. You can it can work. I would still say that you should learn Sentinel. Like, see, my thing is, if you're not trying to if you're not trying to learn Sentinel, you aren't really trying to play Marvel, and that's fine. But don't expect to be, I mean, or only expect to be as good as you, you know, you're going to be without learning the whole game. Because like I said, like, fast flights, you know, like, that's a huge part of this game and only a few characters can do it. And only one character can do it really well. You know, and it's just like that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dominating technique. Um, yeah, it's, and it's, it's easier it's, it's, to use it than it is to counter it. There are certain things... There are certain abilities that I just don't have at this game. I mean, I played this game since the, you know since it came out in arcade. You know, I still can't do half the shit people do with Sentinel. Some 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 things that most people would consider basic, I can't do it with with uh, with Sentinel. I can't do that flash. You know, fly and fly and all of that. I'm trying to I'm trying to, to create a team that focuses more on the mental aspect as opposed to the execution or aspect of it. Well, I mean, like, like I said, picking Sentinel is just a good choice because you get bang for your buck. Like, it doesn't, like, if you're picking Storm or if you're picking Sentinel, you're still going to have to do some, you know, some executional shit if you want to be good. 
either way. You know, you're going to have to be offensive with Storm. And you're gonna and and her offense is more high maintenance than Sentinels. I want to say Sentinels. I mean, even even if you mess up, you're gen, you're you're usually like is not as as not in as bad of a situation then as if you had messed up with Storm. So the thing is, if I'm I'm like if you're limiting yourself that way, you're probably limiting yourself in other ways too. These like. Spit fly, on fly, you know, these things are just techniques, and if you can play games, you can do them. I, I really attribute that to, like, not training the right way or whatever, but I would, I, I definitely think that that's not a, something that you can't do or something that anyone can't do. You know, there are some things that people won't be able to do consistently, but I know that even even with those things inherent with the character, you know, if, if there are the some things with Sentinel that most people won't do, I know that most things that most people can do are are worth it. And even if you even if it's been forever and you haven't learned that thing those things um that doesn't mean that you can't you probably can and maybe you just need to figure out a different way to practice it okay yeah so i guess with that i'm going to wrap up the mvc2 portion of this because um you know, not going to get into much history rehashing without Jay here. We'll pick that up. <clears throat> Sorry, just a second. We'll pick that up again with, um, with I guess, our part three or whatever when that comes up again. So now I am going to reveal my super ill science to the world. Now, before I get into my science... I'm gonna let y'all know that this is this is science still in progress. This is still research that is being actively done. Therefore, my theory is not totally complete, but I don't know. Why not share it? You know, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of screwball, but I think it's awesome. So basically, this is what I'm working on. Is my my 2D fighting game theory of everything. Okay? Because, like, on Alphaism, I really want to be... I want I want to have this approach f for, like, really having practical um, discussions and, and ideas about playing the game. Alright? So... So, you know, this is this is the kind of science that I think that Iron Man, Tony Stark's or or Bruce Wayne would be interested in. You know, even though both of these are, you know, they're self-made, they're self-made men, they're both men of science. They're not well, they're not both self-made men. Batman's not totally self-made. But you know, they're both men of science, and I think that they would appreciate this theory that I'm working on. Um and essentially it's this. This is not um this is not the way to play games, but with what what I what I mean to get at with this is, what are you thinking about when you play games? What are you doing? What is your goal? And what is the difference between um you know a strategy employed here and a, and a slightly different strategy employed here? Something you know the jab and you know the fierce or the, or the cross up or whatever like. You know, if you're trying to teach someone how to play a game, where, from what perspective can you can you show them what's the best to do something? It's hard to explain when everything is subjective, right? And by the way, just so you know, prep time Batman, better than everyone. If Batman was in Marvel vs. Capcom 2... His infinite would be so much better than Iron Man's. But of course that would never happen. Anyway, 
the thing about the um, this theory of everything that I'm working on is it's, it's kind of like this. Anytime you press a button, what were you thinking about when you press that button? What is what button should you press? What um, how good of a choice was that button press? You know, um, so th I'm kind of discounting um, joystick movements for this thing because it doesn't really fact it doesn't really um, fit very well with what I'm trying to do here. So I'm gonna first exclude the joystick movements because um, moving a joystick you can usually not get hit. Um, if you press a button, anytime you press a button you are now risking some of your life because when you press a button you can get hit but if you're just moving and walking or whatever jumping crouching um of course jumping is not totally safe but um you could you could consider jumping as kind of pressing a button for the purposes of what i'm trying to do here because it's 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 doing something aside from just kind of moving safely okay so safe movements um are aside from this, and actually um, jumping would probably be included under pressing a button under this theorem of which I'm on which I'm working. Um, so the thing about this 2D theory of everything is there are attributes which are universal to basically any button press which you should consider when pressing a button, right? Um, and certain attributes are more important than others, and they should always be more important than others, is what I'm proposing, right? So I, I say um, we could assign uh, a value to any of these attributes for like a weight of the the button that you're going to press or the movement or the tactic or whatever you're about to do, not the movement, the, the attack that you're about to unleash, um, and compare different um, options and get a real number. Um, but, I, I mean, I haven't really worked out actual numbers in practice with this, um, but this is kind of like something for a basis for that or something. Anyway, the first attribute, these, so everything that you have to think about when you're pressing a button is first, you know, how, how much is this going to get me, how closer will this get me to winning the video game, okay? Because what you're trying to do with any button press at the end, base is win the game. Like, if you could press one button that said win, then every other button would be irrelevant, and the win button would always be the best button to press, right? So, all these games I want to know, I mean, all these buttons I want to know, like, what, what, um, how close would they be to a button that said win? And if it was a win, then I would say, you know, 1.0 to win times, you know, one, wait, yeah, one is the weight, so like, these are decimals, so the one weighing by anything, you would get the one and then you, you win, because, you know what I'm saying, I'm bad with math, I'm good with logic, anyway, moving on, number one, right, strongest damage, um, the first thing that you need to consider is how much damage does this move do? Uh, how much how much damage will this will this this button press do to the other to the other guy? Because you need to do damage to the other person, and that is the way that two D fighting games are won generally, right? So I would say that like you know half of point five of this. This um this result that you would end with is weighted towards the damage, right? And you know you would be factoring things like what percentage of the other guy's total life is this going to take? You know, if I'm going to do a jab, 
or if I'm going to do a fierce. You know, the fierce is going to do more than the jab. And if the, you know, so so if, if I can do a fierce, I'll probably choose a fierce based on damage. But theory says you can't just think about damage. So after damage, the next thing that is next as uh, it's, it's half as important, right? Um, half as important as damage is Okizeme attempts, or Okizeme attempts, Okizeme, Oki, Oki, wait, right? Offensive pressure after the move, after the button, right? How, how much more can I get, how much more damage, right? Cause, so this refers back to the number one category, right? How much more damage can I get after I press this button, right? So that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's good shit, right? Because it's related back to the number one, and, and it says, how much more of that shit can I get, right? So if this isn't a combo, right, then this category is going to be taken care of pretty directly because you can say how much more damage is the next hit in the combo, how much more damage can I get in a combo. So if you're just in that analyzing combos, then you know you just you have that built in. Um, but you know, Oki, it's it's not necessarily always guaranteed. Um, that factors in later. Um, but that is, I would say, the next most important aspect of a button press. How much damage can I get? Right. Then how much more damage can I get? Right. Then next thing I would say. This one might be a little bit debatable to put in at this point. Also, it's not always present, so it doesn't really matter. But I'm going to say meter, right? Um, and right around here, um, stun would also come in. Um, stun, I would say, uh, maybe it's in between these two. Because it's kind of like Oki, um, but uh, like a guaranteed thing. So... Meter enables you to do more damage later, right? And meter will give you access to more Oki options later, right? So it refers back to those other two things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not as important as the Oki or the damage Oh, right. No, you know what? Actually, I put stun back with damage anyway. Um, but whatever. Um, you get more meter, you can do more damage. You get more meter, you have more Oki options, right? Makes sense. Moving on from meter, the next important thing about the button, right, is the... This doesn't really make any sense. You see, I don't know about this part. Well, what I have here is percent, average percent to hit. I don't really know what I was thinking here because, like I said, if, okay, well, if it's a combo, then this part is going to drop out and it won't really factor. I mean, you know, it, it won't detract from your value. But if what you're trying to do is some sort of reset, right? Ah, right, okay. If you're going to do a reset, this is this is the next thing that's important. If you're going to do a reset, and it's one of those resets that no one ever blocks, then you know this this only will go down a little bit. But if it's uh, some crazy reset that looks ridiculous and has a low percentage to hit, then this is going to um, detract from your the the possibility that you should press this move. I don't know. This this part of the equation may change. Last thing um, is the difficulty in what you're trying to do with your button press. And this is kind of uh, like a weird part of the equation because I would say that this is actually can be weighted more than all the other things. Because if the move or if the, the technique, if it's a, a combo or something that you can't do, and you've never done it ever in your life, then you just shouldn't do it, right? If you're gonna, if you're trying to do a combo, 
that you've missed 100 out of 100 times, then there's probably no chance of you hitting the combo. So it kind of will nullify the whole... The, the, the whole rest of the equation, the whole point of trying to do, trying to press a button. Um, but if it's something that you hit, you know, 100 out of 100 times, then this will not affect anything. Um, yeah. Um, the last thing of it is, like, the real percent to hit. I don't really know what I'm trying to figure out there, but um, the, the caveat there is that if you know something is going to hit, then it's worth it to do it anyway. Um, even if it's, even if it's risky, even if you get less meter or something like that, or, you know, even if you, um, even if you're, even if it's not guaranteed to hit, but if you like know one of this is one of those those X factors like you I know this guy is gonna gonna not not gonna block this reset because he never blocks it or like I know he's gonna wake up DP right now because he woke up DP the first two times and then he didn't wake up DP the next two times and this time I know he's gonna do it so I'm gonna get out of his range and focus and make it whiff and then fuck him up for it you know um. So, like, you know, that can totally um, uh, skew the whole thing, too, because if you know it's going to, you know it's going to hit, then um, it might be worth it to do it and if you're going to get more damage. And it comes at the end of the scale. Anyway, like I said, those last three parts, kind of shaky, but you kind of get the idea of where I'm going here. I'm trying to say... What do we? What do we? What are we really thinking about when we press these buttons? Because it, you know as well as I do, if you play these games after a while, it becomes autopilot, and you know that there's a lot of things that a lot of uh, split-second decisions that you make that have kind of become refined. Where we uh, there's a lot of us in the scene where we know what's the best thing to do right there. It's just it's just kind of like you know, commonly known, right there, you were supposed to do this combo, and you didn't do it, and that's why you lost, or something like that, so, um, this is, you know, the kind of thing that you that I think, um, goes into, um, having that kind of knowledge, um, if you guys have any questions about this, yeah, definitely hit me up, and someone's already answered it, um, one of my things, sweet. Um, like I said, I'm still kind of figuring this out, but I definitely think there's, like, kind of some bearing to it, and if you, I guess if you have any ideas about it, then, you know, hit me up. You it's know, mine. I'm publishing this. I'm writing a paper on this, baby. I'm getting published. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. This is totally... You know what my uh, feeling is? Um, ever since I started back playing Marvel, and, um, one thing I'm starting to do now that I've never done before... <laughs> When I play Marvel, I don't think. I just do. And mm -hmm. I just take it as it comes to me, you know. And mm -hmm. I realize that that's the reason why I lose about 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you yep. something. It is Go not ahead. easy changing that. Um, I, to under, to, to under, you was just talking about what was you thinking when you hit this button. I wasn't thinking shit when I pressed that button. I pressed that button because it seemed like a good idea at the time. Not because the, t the the situation dictated it, or I was had a particular plan in mind. I'm just hitting buttons. So I realized that I used to be a selective masher. I mean, in other words, I'm no different than the guy that just mashes on the machine that you see at the arcade. I'm just more selective at it, but still with the same result, as in I get killed. So yeah. Well, somebody just well. First off, let me just say. Someone just brought up an interesting point and said, and asked, what about risk to get hit? And yeah, that is key. I think that that will have to go in somewhere around that percent to hit shit. Maybe that's what I was thinking around then. I have really, really sparse notes on this when I was making this. And, uh, right, I was wilding that day, but I still think this is dope. So yeah, the risk. And that also is, it's, 
is somewhere covered in that real percent to hit bit that I was figuring out and stuff. But yeah, like definitely risk on getting hit will have to be a largely weighted um, factor. Yeah, yeah. So 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 yeah, for risk to come in, um, if it's obviously if it's a, a bigger move, a laggier move, um, move with more recovery, then. Um, it would be less uh, favorable for you to press the button. Yeah, there. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Where would you guys think that risk would come in? I think that risk would probably be one of the strongest rated factors. Actually, I would put it up there. Um, probably it, may, it might have to just be number one with um, along with damage and make it equal, and then that pushes everything else back down. So yeah, good shit, man. Thanks, John Chimpo. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so, so right. What you were saying is, to to relate this to what you were saying, yeah. The thing about Marvel, one of the things about Marvel, and this is a huge thing about Marvel, is that you have to think faster in Marvel than you do in most other games. Pace of the game is fast. Um, you have a lot of options to do at once, right? But um, when you get um, a little bit more experience with your team. And in little more situations, then you know what what you're kind of going for, and you'll be able to to refine these choices a little bit more faster. But in reality, you need to be thinking about these things on some level, even if it's not. I mean, it's obviously like generally you're gonna just think like like damage and risk, you know, and you're kind of streamlining the rest of these things, but once you get to, once you get past, like, if it's a low risk and it's some high damage, you know, it's like the difference between if you hit someone with a short with cable and they're standing, will you, will you be able to see that convert and do the full fiercest combo with, you know, four standing fierces and a viper beam and get all that extra meter and get all that extra damage? Or will you just do a short, short roundhouse and an air hyper viper beam or just a knockdown or something, you know, like, you got to think, like, what am I getting from what I'm doing, you know, and you can't press buttons for no reason. And that's the whole point. Can't press no buttons for no reason. Now I understand that now it's just a figuring out. Because you know what, here's the thing about it is with me learning Marvel and learning how to think and everything. It's cool though, but you know, it's cool that I'm cool with J Mar and some of the other Seattle uh, players, you know, Preppy and everything and 'cause you know, they all give me tidbits to to really kinda So hopefully I have a little bit more success. When I did it last time, I played this game seriously. Um, but yeah, tr playing and not and um, playing and thinking at the same time, I normally just play. <laughs> so, um, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it's serious, man. But I mean, ever since I started thinking, I realized that um, it's not that bad. It's just that I don't have the execution. I mean, simple combos still elude me, you know, 10 years later. Um, but, um, but hopefully I can, maybe if I get good enough with the mental aspect of the execution, become less and less of a factor, at least I hope. Yeah. Yeah, those things still come. I mean, I really believe that you got to train the right way and some people just don't know and some people most people stumble across it you know like what works for them and what's good to do and the intersection of these two um you know you got to have some comp that you can play to put these things into practice and you got to do some training mode and just kind of work the kinks out and if you don't have some comp that's like somewhere near your level you're never really going to have the environment that you need to do those things when you need them so i think that that's really the strength in online play and that's why i think that you know people could get decent 
at Marvel because now you have that avenue. You just need to be able to find, to play some people that aren't going to destroy you. You need to be able to get your rocks off, you know. And once you get your rocks off on somebody a couple times, then you know you can do that. And once you once you got that, then you know you can move on, and you you know you can build your skill set. You know the defensive options are going to be much harder to learn until you're exposed to them. So that's something that will you know come longer and more in the long run. But you got to be able to do your combo, you know, hit your reset and stuff like that, you know. And it doesn't matter if you're playing Justin Wong or fucking Justin Long, you know. A reset is a reset. If he blocks it, he blocks it. If he doesn't, then you know he got fucked. Oh, at house right now. Are you in the abyss? Are the are the aliens coming for you? Is that Ripley behind you? But with that blowtorch, what is that? I don't know, man. I I think that's on your end. How's it on my end? I ain't even doing nothing. Now it's dying away. Okay, Ripley's uh. on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. That happened earlier tonight. I was like, oh, "Excuse me." Um. Yeah, I thought it was my phone, dude. I mean, my fan. <laughs> and I turned my fan off, and I was—I've been blazing in here all night because of it. Mm. Man, okay. I just want to say that I want part of the royalties when, when you get through with this book. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I was thinking more of an like an academic paper, but if I if I do a book, then yeah, sure. I would, I would love to do a book deal. If any publishers are listening, I'm available. We should we should discuss one last thing. Um, we talked about this earlier, but I am I feel so sorry for all of you King of Fighters uh, fans out there. Obviously, S and K Playmore does not give a fuck about you. All right, and I and I am so sorry. I mean, at least when we lobbied for GGPO for you know Capcom, at least they acknowledged it. They maybe they haven't used it yet. Yeah, but at least they acknowledged it and eventually licensed it. S and K Playmore won't even talk. They only only really consider it. That's so unfortunate, man. I, we need somebody on the in the inside of Japan's uh, SNK Playmore because it looks like that the message is not getting there. Now they just announced a patch today. Did you see Ski? They say they announced a patch with extremely encouraging results for the online play. I'm sorry. Encouraging who? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what I was asking. Encouraging everybody to turn their fucking game. That's the first thing that popped in my head. Hey man, you ever had rainbow nerds? Is that the candy? Yeah, man. They're like little crack rocks. They're so good. <laughs> I should have had one since I was like 12. Rainbow man, nerds. you gotta get some. Man, they come in a big box and it's like 99 cents. I eat hot tamales like they're going out of style. That's my that's my weakness. Hot tamales <laughs> wow. and Suzy Q's. <laughs> what the fuck? You never had a Suzy Q? Man, what are you talking about? You're like, you eat like 1960s candies and stuff. <laughs> Hot tamales and Suzy Q's. Oh man, I bet a baby Ruth is just a treat for you. <laughs> no, seriously, man. I, I could not get a good get bar and up. a Zag Nut. I mean, a I fucking mean, O. Henry and a. You know what I really want right now? I have a craving for some cherry nihilators. Anyone used to eat nihilators out there? Um, we used to get nihilators a lot because they were like the cheap candy, you know. Exactly. I used to sell nihilators in my school a lot. Buy a bag, break them up. Break it down the sections. Candy by these selections. That's a biggie, man. Is it, it, it's shaped. How, how am I gonna describe it? It is shaped like a bar of soap. 
imagine a ice cream sandwich, a chocolate ice cream sandwich, but instead of ice cream in between the two pieces of chocolate, it's it's um, whipped cream, like you know, just cream. The, it's it's two chocolate bread pieces with whipped cream between the two of them, like a sandwich. Was that a Suzy Q? Yeah. Why, is, man? Suzy Q's now latest in the orange cupcakes. Suzy Q's, man, come on! That don't even sound like no candy. It is. It's still be, It's still being sold. Go to Seven Eleven. And go into the, uh, the candy you. section, the sweet section. I swear, uh, you will find a Suzy Q there. I believe you, man, but you could get some better candy. You know, like Gobstoppers. That sounds like candy, right? What is a Suzy Q? That's like some chick that won't give you a date. <laughs> I don't know why they call it Suzy Q. Is it shaped like a Q? No. It's shaped like a bar of soap. <laughs> it sounds like a moon pie. <laughs> yeah, see, see, Avalon stuff knows what I'm talking about. By the way, hey, so um, let's talk about a couple other things real fast before we um wrap up tonight. <laughs> In the world of video gaming, uh-huh. right? Yeah. First, we had we had a, there was a lot of uh, crazy events this weekend. Um, but the two that I want to talk about first, um, I guess first, well, well, there's, well, I don't know which one to give top billing. So there was SBO and there was QuakeCon, right? And I don't know anything about Quake, so I shouldn't really save that for last to try to talk about it like I know some shit about it. Yeah, playing Quake like, against my religion. Go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, like QuakeCon, um... Some American dude won that shit, and his name is Rafa, and that was sick, right? Because, like, America won some video game shit, and that was sweet, because right. America needs to win, and we won. Good shit to Rafa, holding it down for the Masters Tournament of the Quake Live, Quake Con Tournament 2009. It was really nail-biting finals. He went down 2-0. And a first to five, or first to three, first to three, best to five. So he, the the comeback that he made was like serious. Like he was down 2-0, but the matches that he lost were kind of like he had them won, and then dude made Swedish dude Sparty made like crazy comeback. So then Rafa kind of like tightened it up, lacked it down, and won the next three rounds pretty convincingly. So. That was pretty sweet. Um, did you? Are you allowed to talk about it, or like, do you have to say prayer afterwards? Like, do you have to? I mean, I got talk. I got to talk about it, but then I got to go find a sheep and sacrifice it. Oh uh, well, I mean, are you up for that tonight, or because you know that's, that's cool? Fine. I mean, like, I have twenty four hours to do it before I'm condemned. So. Well, yeah, you know, there's not really much to say about it because. Fucking, I don't play it, so I don't know anything about it. So I don't have anything to say about it. But that was um, that was a sweet, sweet um, thing to be able to watch, and it's always good to see some video games being shoutcast, and that was being handled by DJ Wheat and his crew, and it was a really high quality stream. So that was cool. Here comes Ripley with the fucking cool torture. Dude. They're, I think they're in the corridor below you. They're, you better watch out. That sounds like they're in the corridor. I didn't know right now, actually. Um, all right, SBO, okay. Uh, boo for not being streamed, but, you know. So, boo for that. Um, I don't, I still don't know what place our, um, our American players took, uh, wind up in. Last every game. JJ. You're kidding me, right? I'm pretty sure that America was eliminated first round in every tournament in Japan since they went over there for SPO. Not just SPO. Because uh, there was the Shields Awa Cup where there were the shenanigans. Did you hear about that? Okay, yeah, I heard about them substituting a player. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean. Yeah, so, so there was that, right? So that's first round. And then there are, like, you know, random other tournaments. But then, so then there's SBO, and 
Um, that was like some emotion gear shit right there. <laughs> Justin, yeah, Justin, Justin's team lost first round to. Um, actually, let me get the the brackets for this if I can find them. Yeah, Justin's team lost first round to um, Nike Rufus and Kiga Kigunasu Sagat. Um, I think they both lost to. No, I, no, yeah, they both lost. So Justin lost to Rufus, I believe, and Marn lost to Sagat. Um, it's probably a close match. From I think it was a close match from what I heard. Had they won that fight, they would have gone on to fight Mago and Nemo. Um, let's see. There was there was the the Cali Power and Combo Fiend West Coast Rushdown um, Kings team. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not sure how the wins and losses broke down, but I know they lost to the Mizo Teru Blanca. Mizo Teru plays Blanca. I know I know they lost to that team. Um, Mizo Teru's teammate was Ichi, like another Sagat. You know, every team almost had either a Sagat, a Geef, a, a Ryu, or an Akuma. Um, um, what else was cool about this tournament? Um, oh, wait, wait, who, well, who else were the Americans? I know there was another. Uh, there was the Texas team of Fubar Duck and John Lowe, and they lost first round to... Yoshio Guile and E. Desu Kesubat, one of the teams that didn't have a Ryu, a Sagat, an Akuma, or a Geef. Um, but those guys are good. I, I think I've seen some videos of Yoshio. I've definitely seen videos of E. Desu Kesubat Honda, and he's good. Um, yeah, Street Fighter 4, we all we got lost. <laughs> and then... That was a really interesting tournament. The last chance qualifiers had uh, Makoto, who is the only Grandmaster Vega player, the Claw, the Claw player in um, in Japan. So that means he's the only one with over a hundred thousand K BP, and he made it through the last chance qualifiers with Dan. So the Dan. only character that wasn't represented in the SBO final bracket was El Fuerte, and that's the only character that there is no Grandmaster in Japan too. So. That's kind of, yeah. that's kind of, kind of iconic, um, kind of meaningful, I guess. But and El Fuerte, dude, I don't know. Capcom, you need to help that dude out. There was a bunch of re- uh, upsets in this tournament, um, but basically, coming down to. Mago and Nemo making it through to the top eight. Other other teams very favored like Daigo and uh, Nuki Ume Nuki team. They lost one round before the top eight to Ume So Honda and Dashio Viper. And I'm not sure how the wins and losses broke down. On, yeah, but dude, Viper Dashio Viper Dashio is one of the best Vipers in Japan. Oh, you said and, Dashio. Oh, never mind. Never, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it comes down to, you know, there were two Vipers in the top eight. And uh, that was the only character that was represented twice in the top eight. So, you know, the, we saw the tier lists in this game. And there was the one that came out in February that put Viper at S+. Plus, and then she started to fall. But, you know, she clearly is capable of, of winning shit because... There were a lot of Vipers in SBO, a pretty good amount, and I mean, even still, like, the tournament was won by Gosho of, of Rufus and Kabetsu, or, or Cabbage, or whatever his name is, uh, another Viper, and that team, in the first round, beat the team of Umezono and Uryo, and Uryo is probably the best Viper in Japan right now that's actively playing. If not, Dashio. So, you know, the, that team with a Viper, a really good Viper, beat the best Viper and then made it through to the finals where there was another Viper in the top eight. Um, Dashio's team did not, however, make it to the grand finals. They lost to the EO, 
and Shiro team of Dawson and Abel, one of the real okay. dark horse teams. That was the team, and that team got second place. It's Abel. It's Abel, actually. <laughs> kind of like, kind of almost sounds like Apple. You have to avail Apple. yourself of the situation. Apple. It's Apple. Yeah, that's what it is. Apple. <laughs> um. So yeah, so yo, 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 and Shiro. That that was a really good team. They lost a ton of they they lost a ton of qualifiers. Almost looked like they weren't going to make it to SBO, and that was very surprising because Shiro is hands down the best able, and Io won the national tournament. So you know you would expect a lot from this team, and they I guess they delivered in the end after <laughs> failing to qualify repeatedly. They were able to capture second place at the SBO tournament. Um. Any other teams that were of so, note? What, so you're going to talk about Boss, Momochi, and Ricky Maru? Oh, man. Third Strike. I don't, I don't even look at any other games. Oh, All right, I'm so sorry. I thought, I'm sorry. I thought was, I would look at the wrong one. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that was Third Strike. It was won by third, Boss, right. Momochi, and Ricky Maru. Momochi played Makoto. Boss die, played, I don't even know. Ricky Maru. Eh. Whatever. All I know is KO made it to the finals and he lost again, and that happens all the time. And that's pretty much the story to take away from that one. News and other games. Um, right, yeah. And also in Third Strike, both of our teams lost first round. Um, or, or the one team that we had. I don't know, whoever. Um, that's okay. You know, we, they're still winners. Of course. Then we had, uh, Blaz Blue. Um, the tournament was won by a, a Rockanoon player. We had Hart Nana in that tournament, and he looked and he looked poised to do very well in that tournament until it was revealed that his opponent was the best um, player of the best character in the game in Japan. So it was an unfortunate draw for him, and he was not able to make it past the first round in that game. Um, our Tekken reps, I don't know. They didn't... I don't even know who they were. Um, they didn't make it through the first round, and we had... I don't even know if we had any, um, but I know that um, Mr. Naps went there to try to qualify in the last chance qualifiers. He wasn't selected, so he didn't get the chance. Um, we don't we had, suck at fighting games. We blow. There's a difference. Yeah, we blow. Let's get blown. So there was a... Uh, all oh, right, so then there was the Guilty Gear team of uh, Marn and Flash Metroid playing two-man team. Their third partner was not present, so they went uh, handicaps. And they were OCD'd by Woshige's or Woshiage's team, who went on to win the tournament. So, it's also a bad draw, I guess. Right. What was that? What character were they using? Um, Flash Metroid played Jam, I think. And Morn and probably played Eddie. Play, like Eddie or something, probably. I mean, I mean the winning team. They say, you say the, the oh, team. they they played something crazy, dude. I don't even know. <laughs> like Guilty Gear, it's kind of unpredictable when you come out there. You'll see, you'll be able to see any of those characters in there. I've seen Zappos. Yeah. I've seen. I saw the second place team had uh, a Zappa on it, actually, which was surprising, because I play Zappa, and that guy is ass, too. I mean, he's okay, but he's not, like, you know, top tier or anything like that. But, um... He's, he's, he's the Guilty Goods version of Ale Birthday. Dude, that is not cool. <laughs> um... Woshiage. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, right. Thought I just. Yeah, Woshige. He played Melia, and they. I know Woshige beat Marn's team. The other two characters on his team were Shonen, who plays or Testament, played by Shonen, and Venom, played by N O. Um. I hate so yeah. Really? It, really? it really gets really stupid when you play against a good Venom player. Fuck we had... Paul Balls. We had... 
we had two teams there. No, we had three teams there in Guilty Gear. I think they all got, they all lost first round. Okay, this um, is really depressing. Um, even had Latif, the the Saudi Arabian robot, there, and I think that, I think they said that 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 round or game or whatever was close, but I'm pretty sure that um, they did not make it past the first round as well. Um, right. See, let me talk about this uh, single limb stuff before I go to, gotta go to bed. Um, I think. You know, the SBO format is what the SBO format is. Um, it's single limb. You know, it's it's got qualifying tournaments that are single limb. Most of the tournaments in Japan are single limb. And single limb is what the landscape of their scene is. I don't think that the results of SBO are indicative of who would necessarily win at EVO and vice versa because the formats are so different that they're catered to different strengths and I mean on that subject I, I think that American players in general are different than Japanese players because our base understanding of a game this is tournament players only obviously our base understanding of a game comes from two out of three and their Japan's base understanding of the game comes from one game, and the real differences that this makes in the gameplay is that American players are able to take some time and try to devise plans more and are a little bit more experienced in counter strategies, I would say, whereas Japanese players are definitely stronger with execution and um, very straightforward 50-50 options um, and really really codified play because if you're only going to play one game you know you don't really have the luxury of trying to get get fancy or or get creative as much you know there's just the time doesn't permit it so the scenes are inherently different. Um, the and, and as such, like the people that excel at them, both are going to be different. For for Americans to actually win at SBO, I mean, I think that Americans would need to throw more single limb tourneys for one. But I don't really think that that's going to do it, and. I don't necessarily think that there's anything that can do it like like that definitively. There's there's not really. I mean the the scenes are just so different. Like Americans are still disadvantaged in the sense that they can't play together as much, and that that's, that's just going to limit yeah. limit us forever. GGPO helped us defeat Japan. I mean, it helps, but it doesn't. It's, I mean, what? Can you play Street Fighter 4 on GGPO? No. Like, it's cool. It helps. But it ain't it. And even if it was, like, it would help. Even if, G, you know, even if GGPO was in Street Fighter 4, it's still... I still would have shitty connections with the West Coast. I have, I don't really play people from the West Coast in many GGPO games because connections are not that great. I mean, it's not GGPO's fault; it's my crappy connections yeah. fault. But there yeah, are people with crappy GGPO connections. Fiber optic. That's what Dude, as soon as FiOS comes to Baltimore, I'm down. But until until com until Verizon st uh, starts caring about black people, we oh, we are going to be stuck with this <laughs> DSL shit. You need to move to Richmond, Virginia. That is the worst place for me to go, dude. That is, woof. That that place is not good. <laughs> that place is fucked. <laughs> I may as well stay in Baltimore if I'm gonna go down yeah. there. At least, I'm, at least it's not like actually down south. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> no. 
So, yeah, I mean, I think that, like, it really just is, like, different scenes and different approaches, and I don't really know. Like, it would be very, very hard for us to win SBO, and, you know, it's obviously a little bit easier for them to win EVO because in SBO you can lose once only, and here you can lose many times, and that's kind of like training for this format, hyperbolized or whatever. But still, you know... When you see someone like Justin Wong, who actually uses those things, the advantages that are inherent in the format, and kind of crafting a plan and learning tendencies over a long period of time, you saw that he was able to compete with Daigo, who is obviously a much stronger player in other areas. So, you know, it's not to be said that the format alone dictates the player, you know, I feel like, you know, the player that's the best on the format is going to win the tournament, you know, and that the one that gets a little bit of luck, too. So, it's just, I mean, trying to win SBO, we would have to be trying to play little SBOs all the time, and not only do we not have that style of tournament, we can't because we, I mean, we're not close enough to do it. I mean, SBO is... One point, like, it's, I mean, SBO exists, but SBO in itself is, is a dozen or dozens of other tournaments, qualifying tournaments, you know. The reason that it's like that is because they can run tons of small tournaments, or, or not even necessarily small, but consistent tournaments is the thing. They can run many tournaments. So if you're not in one, then it doesn't matter. You didn't, you didn't, you can go to the next one. You know, it's, the, the just tournaments are different. Inherently, there. You know, there might be three tournaments a week in an arcade. Before Whereas, I, forget, <clears throat> I need to advertise hmm? something. Um, this coming Saturday, August the 22nd, is Northwest Major. Get height. All right. <laughs> and to the Tacoma, Washington, come there. Get your money taken. Um, it's, it's our annual uh, Northwest Major tournament and you know if you want to play you know the best in Street Fighter 4 and Marvel that's the place to come uh, you can even play Trace who is the highest um, placing Sagat at Evo at 13th place not bad for out of a thousand plus man tournament so uh, I'm gonna see if I can get some Northwest players on the on the radio um, two of them I'm thinking right now is Ratana and Jamar. If I can get them both on the radio, that'd be pretty cool. So, um, yeah, so don't forget about Northwest Majors. Come there, get your money taken. Have a great time. Go home, bro. All right. Sounds good. Well, that's really all I got for tonight, and I definitely have to work in the morning, so... I'm gonna have to get going. Sleep is for the week. Oh no, I hear you. All right, man. And um, so you're gonna. Well, let me just say that this has been Alphaism Radio, and um, tonight we continued our series on Marvel vs. Capcom 2. I did a, a brief primer for those who would like to get into the game. Um, I kind of gave you my thoughts on what it might take to jump in, and what might be best for you as a player to bring, you know, your already existing skill sets and ideologies into the game and interfacing with it as best uh, and as efficiently as possible. Um, Bunke was here with me tonight, and Shin Baka as well. Um, yeah, and uh, I kind of went down through the teams there from Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Also, we went over my introductory talk on my 2D theory of everything, my, my theory behind what we should all think about when we press any button in these games that we're playing. Uh, likewise, uh, we heard about um, what we should think about, uh, learn, learning about how to develop what we think about when we press buttons, um, a tutorial, uh, a continuing tutorial session, or the the reprisal, the reprisal of uh, 
of Bunkay's Marvel vs. Capcom 2 True Doing Service, and this time he's got Sue Mighty uh, available for lessons, and you can check out more details on that on uh, alphaism.com forums. That's forums.alphaism.com, A-L-P-H-A-I-S-M.com. Check it out. Um, and uh, you should play Marvel vs. Capcom too if you have any interest in it. Don't let uh, learning curve or whatever um, get you down. Because if you think that the game is fun, then play the game and have fun, and you'll learn. Um, what I'm offering you is some expedience, some some great ways to streamline your learning. But as long as you're having fun, you know, keep playing. That's what I think is most important. And, yeah, Street Fighter Fall. That's it for me. Uh, I'm Ski Sonic, so I'm going to say goodnight. Thanks for listening. Thanks to anybody who was recording. Um, and we'll try to get this one up for you soon. And uh, goodnight, everybody. Okay.